had a few reflections from yesterday, especially for those who, in a sense, uh, are very contentious, lively, energetic uh, afternoon session yesterday. And, uh, you know, the argumentative Indians were in full flow. Uh, there was a lot of uh, venting and cribbing about institutional limitations, about, uh, uh, you know, departmental politics and uh, uh, lack of vision, all the usual things that we hear. Uh, and uh, people had their hobby horses, pet peeves, uh, why history of science isn't done, why Indian mathematics hasn't been properly studied because the entire Macaulayite, uh, you might say, plank or uh, ideological justification for ruling India was that we were scientifically deficient. But we can show that we were very advanced in mathematics. You know, all these all these kinds of arguments came up. But the one thing I just wanted to, you know, touch on very briefly, and then we can take it up again in the concluding session. And I'm saying this partly because Lavanyaji wasn't there. And I, th I thought it was a very important point that came out, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the disciplinary debates on what constitutes uh, the desideratum of Indian history, of writing a new Indian history. What are the desiderata, if you want to make it plural? And, uh, 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 you know, I can only repeat that we see that uh, we have conflicts over the nature of the discipline. We have uh, conflicts over, uh, uh, you know, how to reclaim our heritage. And we have a, you know, conflict over history as a struggle. You know, it's a, it's a struggle. Uh, in a sense, history, a struggle history as discipline, history as heritage. All these three issues were discussed yesterday, quite threadbare. But one thing that came up, which I'm just going to throw up and then hand it over to uh, throw out, not throw up. Uh, it's too early in the morning to throw up. But to throw out uh, Lavanyaji was that, uh, uh, you know, one of the speakers, Professor Aghotam, who's not here as yet, he said the legitimating principle for rewriting Indian history is the fact that we are a sovereign nation. Now, I thought this was a very interesting statement he made because he was, he was critically examining the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan project of history, multi-volume, and then what Professor Dilip Chakravarti has edited, 12 volume of which eight volumes have come out. So obviously this doesn't apply necessarily to individuals who are writing histories. Like today, I'm going to welcome later in the day, Dr. Uday Kulkarni, who is writing Maratha history, you know, tremendous amount of material. He's published six, seven books. We'll talk about that later. So this doesn't apply necessarily to uh, people who are working, uh, you know, as individuals or writing, you know, histories uh, of their chosen areas of specialization. I think this applies more to these larger projects and also to government policy. But he said the legitimating principle for rewriting the history of India is the fact that we are a sovereign nation now. And uh, if, then, he, then he said that as a democracy, sovereignty rests, uh, sovereignty vests with the people of India. That's what the constitution says. So he says that uh, the stakeholders, the stakeholders uh, of a, uh, rewriting Indian history project are the people of India. You know, he he made that statement, and now, yesterday I was reflect on reflecting on it after I went home at the end of the day, and it seems to me that if you extend that, and if you say that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the legitimating principle for rewriting Indian history is not only the sovereignty of India as a republic, as a nation, which vests with the people of India, but of India as a civilization. And now that uh, Dr. Nalini Rao is with us, I just wanted to say that if you if you want to do that, if if, uh, if you want to uh, understand India as a civilization, then you know just restricting ourselves only to history narrowly defined as an academic discipline 
is not sufficient because you need all kinds of other things. You need archaeology because obviously some form of humanoids or hominins have been here for two million years. Two million years from our records, from you know Paleolithic times, or you know, so. So you need archaeology, you need uh, geology, geography. You also need art history. You need uh, people who can understand uh, architecture, temple architecture. You need people who can understand literature, uh, the epics, people who can understand uh, itihas, purana, as we call it, but also all kinds of texts, the Tripitaka, the Vedas. So what I'm trying to say is one thing that came to my mind yesterday, at the end of the day, was that we need a more integral approach. We need uh, an integrated, multidisciplinary approach and a multidimensional understanding of Indian civilization. And then obviously, Indian civilization is not to be seen in isolation. It was in, in interaction from the earliest times with other civilizations. So I'll just end here by saying it seemed yesterday we needed a multidimensional approach, a multidisciplinary approach. And when it comes to history itself, a way of approaching history, uh, which was also in a way, uh, uh, you know, multidimensional, not, uh, not confined as often, uh, you know, we've seen in the past to history wars, to writing histories, anti-histories, alter histories, revenge histories, non-histories, and or to say we are ahistorical. Indians are ahistorical, you know. So we don't we don't exist in history. We exist in eternity. You know, we are Akalis. You know, we 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 have a diff we we only we are in the Mahakal, not in Kal. You know. So these were some of the interesting things that came up. Later we will we will uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uday Kulkarni, but now I, I want to once again welcome Professor Andre Wing, the former living historian of the so-called medieval period. Uh, and uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. It's a great honor. And I will now hand it over to the convener and moving spirit of this symposium, Professor Lavanya Vemsani. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Makran uh, Paranjve. Um, it's my honor to invite uh, Professor Andre Wink. He has been a great inspiration for many of us. Uh, the first time we have uh, heard his lecture when we were students at Hyderabad Central University, he spoke about Indo-Islamic history. Uh, and we learned a lot of things that we haven't learned from our books or from our regular history reading, uh, such as the largest slave markets in Sindh and Delhi, and the uh, loot uh, that happened in the uh, Indo-Islamic society. And uh, we also learned about the statecraft, how it was uh, one of the main principles were um, derived from Ardha Shastra. Uh, and we also learned about many of the Persian texts that were actually based and translated from Sanskrit texts. So a lot of information that we haven't know, heard or we haven't known. So he had been a great inspiration for many of us. So it's a great honor for me to invite him to speak here. Professor Andre Wink. Uh, he's a emeritus professor at uh, Wisconsin University of Wisconsin Madison. He has uh, written a number of very important books on India, Indo-Islamic history. Uh, Al Hind is three volumes on Indo-Islamic history. Uh, is is a great work on uh, Indian history, Second Mendelian history especially. Brings forward a lot of. Uh, information, a lot of uh, analysis that was not uh, known in India uh, or Indian history at that time. Uh, so I request him uh, to give us uh, his thought. Uh, he's recently released a book. He published a book, uh, Indo-Islamic History, 700 to 1800. It's a long uh, view history, uh, broad uh, broad examination of Indian history, which we need. Uh, as we are re-examining Indian history, uh, this is what we need. We need to see a long, uh, broad spectrum analysis of history. So 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to Professor Wink's lecture and I thank him and we are honored to welcome him. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. Speaker is off. Professor Wink, your speaker is off. But now, is it better? Okay. Now it is good, yes. Perfect, is good? perfect. Yes, good. I don't say perfect because nothing about me is perfect. But um, yeah, so thanks for uh, reminding me of um, my trip to Hyderabad. It was a great pleasure. Uh, we are now, of course, uh, 24 years later, and uh, I have indeed. Um, during the lockdown, in Greece had a very long lockdown, and uh, I published a book in uh, the fall of 2020. Let me show it. I, oh, yeah, here it is. Um, the Making of the Indo Islamic World, which is a short book. And um, I hate to say it, but it was much more difficult for me to write a short book. Some people feel that way than a long one. We really have to uh, think very hard about what you put in there. It's a short book. Uh, I like short books. Uh, I, I mean, there are so many multi-volume works on, on history that people get drowned in all these enormous comprehensive books. So I try to come up with something like a uh, twist, which, is, uh, which has a clear thesis that is um, pretty much the guiding principle of this book, that it has only one thesis and that it is not comprehensive. Um, and now the main thing, uh, so today I would like to use this opportunity or abuse the opportunity to explain uh, what this book really tries to do. This is of course a summary of many things I've, I have already uh, written about in the past, more length, but it also has uh, many um, um, ideas, and I've discussed many subjects that I've never discussed before. Um, this book goes up to about 1800. In other words, um, we are here long before the nation state. And um, it is therefore uh, not so easy to find a suitable term for the area that I cover. Um, you talk about India, yes, but India today is much smaller than what it used to be. And if you talk about the entire Indianized world, you're talking about an even bigger uh, region. And so what I call the Indo-Islamic world is much bigger than India today. It covers the entire Indianized world uh, all the way up to... Um, Indonesia, including Indonesia. There's a good reason we call it Indonesia, the islands of India, after all. And this is part of my concept of the Indo-Islamic world. And on the, in the Western direction, it goes all the way up to, um, well, Afghanistan and Iran. So we're talking about an enormous area here, all the way from Eastern Afghanistan to Eastern islands of Indonesia, the so-called Spice Islands, which in Dutch is called um, India. And so th that is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind when um, I proceed. The Indo-Islamic world is not only the South Asian subcontinent, although that is certainly the biggest part, but it covers a much broader region and a maritime region as well. I, for me, the maritime region is part of the Islamic world. Now, all this is on a map, and if you, uh, I don't know if the book is available in an Indian edition yet, because, I mean, I hardly get any information about these things because of the pandemic restrictions, and uh, you cannot fly, it's really annoying. But uh, I hope that it will be available in the Indian edition soon, if it isn't available already. And then you can see that um, 
there is a map there of what I have just defined, um, the Indo-Islamic world. There is a peculiar situation here that, um, well, the majority of the population, there's about a lot of people living in this area. Nowadays, it's about more than 2 billion people. That's enormous, enormously important. We, uh, yes, the majority of the Muslim population of the world lives in this area today. Uh, this is, of course, well known in South Asia and in the media, but many people who study the Islamic world don't know that. They think that the Islamic world is the Middle East, and that's not the case. We have the majority of Muslims living in South and Southeast Asia. And yet, um, the, they're, they're, they are a minority, because the majority population in the Indo-Islamic world is not Muslim. So these are some peculiarities that, um, for many people, are um, hard to understand. Uh, Islam is an important presence in um, this area, but there was never a, a real conquest, of, um, Islamic conquest. There's no complete transformation or crossover to Islam. <clears throat> and you can say, I mean, I, 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 I say this in the conclusion of the book, the epilogue, this crossover to Islam, it, um, the Indic world, is in some respects a comparable to what happened in the Middle East in late antiquity. That is to say, you have a polytheistic ancient tradition, uh, Greek and Roman, and that is a, a crossing over to a polytheistic religion, first Christianity and later um, Islam. And this has been going on in the Indo Islamic world as well. You have a crossover to a revealed religion, but only partly so. That is um, the, the situation. So, in this book, um, I have come to um, five, I would call five main conclusions. But before I tell you what they are, let me say a word about the methodology. After all, this conference is about methods as well. I understand. Um, the methodology that I am using, I try to go uh, beyond the, the purely textual evidence, both the Indological and the Islamological textual evidence, although I find this text very important. Uh, it's not, I find them very important and indispensable. But I, I do think also that by themselves they are not enough. <clears throat> As an aside, I may point out that many of the makers, very important figures of the Indo-Islamic history, were themselves actually illiterate. Um, for example, Timur was illiterate, and Alauddin Alji was illiterate earlier than Timur. And of course, Akba is a very important figure, maybe the most important, possibly. And uh, later on, Haida was actually also a literate. But these are what we may call um, the most important figures in the making of the Indo-Islamic world. And they were not, they didn't have access to texts themselves. So I have um, tried to to do justice to all the texts, both in the on the Islamic side and the Indian side. But I want to go beyond it. I think people have to go beyond it. You cannot write the history of India from, for example, Sanskrit texts. I don't think it's possible. But you can use them. <clears throat> uh, my approach is therefore, um, I would say, uh, grounded uh, in particular uh, in the study of geography, I think this is very important for uh, all parts of the world, but it is equally important in, uh, in this area. Geography and environmental history are becoming more and more important in the study of Indian history and in all history again. Um, I also use um, well, I'm also interested in world history. I would say this book, that, uh, this book is basically a world historical 
interpretation of the history of India. So I take a lot of um, interest in world history and environmental history. And uh, historical anthropology, I think, is extremely important for me. Uh, archaeology, of course, and what we might call the natural archive, the study of uh, epidemics, uh, all kinds of things that have to do with uh, biology. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for that sort of what we call the natural archive. Like people have done, for example, in Roman history. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the book by Carl Harper, um, which is called um, The Fate of Rome, which is essentially an environmental history of Rome. And he also uses this concept of natural archive. I think that is crucial in um, the future study of the history of that, of our area. So, um, textual materials, yes, I find them extremely important, but uh, also all other evidence, including the natural archive. So this is, if you look, if you listen up this, I'm going to go um, through the five conclusions now, actually. If you wonder where do I, how did I get to these conclusions, now you know, it's not only reading uh, text, but uh, particularly uh, study of geography and the environment, natural archive. Well, what is my, uh, what are my five conclusions then? Um, let me begin with uh, number one, which is um, the subject of the first two chapters of this uh, small book. <clears throat> uh, the first conclusion is that um, there is no ancient urbanism and ancient empire in India in the way that um, there was in the Near East where the Arab Caliphate developed. This may come as a surprise, this conclusion, and some people may try to resist it. I'm not saying there were no cities in India, quite the contrary. Urbanism was very fragile, and that is a, uh, because of the, because of the uh, very unstable environment in Mosul, India. So urbanism and urban culture and ancient empires were not nearly as important in um, the Indic, Indic world as they were in the Near East where Islam originally um, originated. The Arab Caliphate in the 7th and 8th centuries really emerged at the heart of the ancient imperial world and it took over its urbanism. This is well known. Muslims did not destroy urbanism of the Near East, but actually built upon it. And I am saying here that um, in India, we do not have such an ancient imperial heritage based on urban life. There have been many attempts to prove the contrary. People have searched for ancient Indian empires forever. And it has been uh, uh, very common that people wanted to find some equivalent of the Roman Empire in India. I think that this um, idea that you should find an empire in your country is a colonial legacy. When the Europeans created their overseas empire, they were doing that well, well, spellbound by the um, Roman antecedents. You can see that in the buildings, for example, these constant references to the ancient Roman and Greek past. So it was almost presented as if you, as if you, if you did not have such ancient urban imperial past like Rome, then you were incomplete. It was not you had to somehow have it. And the Indians felt that was they had to therefore come up with some something like the Roman Empire. I think that uh, people today speak about decolonizing Indian history. Well, this is one way it can be done by abandoning the search for a, a counterpart of the ancient Roman Empire in India. I, did, I don't think that there was anything of that kind. <clears throat> I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, my thesis is in this uh, first two chapters that. Um, the monsoon um, 
environment is actually a very unstable environment, uh, largely because these vast river plains, um, they, they are constantly transforming them, themselves. These are, this is perhaps the most ecologically most unstable part of the world. Uh, the great alluvial river plains, which are very important for agriculture, have also been very destructive of cities. <clears throat> Unlike, um, well, the Mediterranean and the Near East, where urbanism was much more durable. So the Greek, Roman, Persian, Byzantine, and Arab Islamic cultures were far more urban. That is the idea I'm trying to advance. As uh, I said, many people drag to this when they first hear it. And uh, I still think that it's not exaggerated. People have heard, of course, about the Indus Valley Civilization. And it is true that um, that was the earliest tradition of urban, or the plant urban um, civilization. But uh, this Indus Valley culture did not survive. Nothing left of that in the Middle Ages, for example. People know about it anymore and um, it was actually rediscovered by accident more or less in the 20th century as you all know uh, so this is exactly um, what I mean this urban culture of the Indus Valley was um, comprehensively wiped out by floods and, and earthquakes and so forth <clears throat> And uh, this sort of establishes the paradigm of Indian urbanism right at the beginning, which is the paradigm of fragile urban centers that um, they can be reasonably large, but they can't last for long, partly because the, largely because of the environmental instability in monsoon Asia. The cities that were developed in the Indus area after the Delhi coast were all suffer the same fate. So this is not a durably and um, densely urbanized area of the world, like, for example, the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that this is a different settlement history. Yeah, so my thesis in the first two chapters is very simple. Um, this Indic monsoon world is the major world region with the most extreme environmental instability. Instability of all kinds, hydrological, which is to say that these great rivers shift their courses all the time. In this, for example, is well known. Um, it's it shifted um, westward over time, and the Ganges was shifting eastward. But this is very, very much the case everywhere in the Indo Islamic world. River shifts were everywhere. Uh, I don't know if you remember the book by uh, Richard Burton on Sindh, uh, which is from uh, before the rediscovery of the Indus Valley culture. It was from 1854, I believe. And he says there is not a single, there is no part of Sindh where the Indus was not flowing at some point, point in the history of that area. And it can shift its course any time, any city in the area. Uh, he says that for Sindh, but you can say that for actually in my opinion, the whole of monsoon Asia. Hydrological instability, um, uh, earthquakes in northern, uh, the northern subcontinent, of course. I don't have, don't have to explain. Um, climatological change, climate change was a very common in evidence. Uh, meteorological change. And then there's, of course, in Indonesia, a lot of volcanic activity which is also uh, creating more instability in that area, although not in India. Even in recent times, there have been major environmental events that, um, uh, in my opinion, were historically very common, like the tsunami in 2004, which was created by an uh, underwater earthquake off the coast of Sumatra and had a devastating impact on the coast of the Bay of Bengal, as we remember probably, 2005, I witnessed myself an earthquake in northern Pakistan in the Karakorum, which killed 80,000 people, it was totally dramatic. And, uh, so this is a recent time, there were more of such events, uh, quite dramatic environmental disruption. And my thesis is that that happened throughout Indian history. 
And the Indus Valley civilization was the first casual field that. So in unstable urbanism, or what I sometimes call in uh, following um, somebody else, Fox, urbanism. Yeah, agricultural cities, really. You cannot really tell whether it's a village or a ten, ten villages put together or a city. So unstable urbanism. <coughs> and I have proved in these chapters that India, and, um, in, this, in the broad sense, is a really a, a graveyard of cities. The archaeologists will be able to confirm this. This is something you can conclude from archaeological study. Uh, I also quote Babur in this context. You uh, have probably all read uh, the Babur now. And uh, well, in my book on page 20, I have quoted his view of Indian urbanism, and I, I quote, in Hindustan, the destruction and building of villages and hamlets, even of cities, can be accomplished in an instant. Such large cities in which people have lived for years can be abandoned in a day, even half a day, such that no sign or trace remains. Well, so you can see I don't make this up. Babu said, Babu is quite a perceptive author. I would say one of the most perceptive authors at that time. <laughs> so a graveyard of cities, the northern Ganges plain, uh, Sins, the Indus area. And the same is true in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. Angkor, for example, a very famous example of a city in Cambodia that was entirely abandoned. There was probably some problem. There were problems with the water management, and malaria broke out, and people moved from that area, which which was uh, very much um, overpopulated. It was maybe a million people, according to some Chinese testimony, living in Angkor at some point, and that may have led to um, all kinds of environmental issues that made it. Uh, impossible to continue living there. And so when the French uh, botanist uh, Moreau arrived in the 19th century, he, he, he runs into these ruins where there's nobody left. And uh, he was looking for butterflies, but uh, this was sort of, he discovered by accident that there had been a major medieval city there. And it's not just another example of a typical Indic pattern of urbanism. Um, instable urbanism. Yeah, and so when I come to um, the study of ancient Indian empires, um, I try to look at them as something different from uh, the sort of empires that people think about when they look at Rome or even Persia. That kind of empires uh, did, in my opinion, um, not exist in ancient times in India. People always talk about the Mauryans and what a mighty empire it was. I don't think so. It was an interesting empire. And it had many, uh, it made many contributions, but it was not, in my opinion, a unified imperial structure. It had a great power of uh, resource mobilization. Uh, this is in line with new research on the Maurya Empire. I'm not the only person to say that. And um, it's certainly important from the, the point of view of religious development of India. And ancient India has, has been very important um, in many ways, scientifically and from the point of view of the development of religion. But it did not have a Roman or quasi-Roman empire. It just didn't. Same is true for the Guptas. I could not confirm there is no evidence that this was a unified total imperial political structure that covered a very large region. It had some kind of ritual role over a large region, but it was not like the Roman Empire. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I think people should accept that it is different. The idea that we all have to have a Roman Empire in our past is very bizarre. So this is the first conclusion that I have drawn in the wake of 
research by others as well, that the um, Indo-Islamic world was much less urban and much, much less textually oriented than the Arab Islamic world, which was focused on the Near East and uh, adopted the urbanism of that area that was um, there over many centuries. And this is why the Indo-Islamic world is very different. It had a very different settlement history. It didn't have ancient empires of that kind. And for this reason, also, the Indo-Islamic world is much more based on customary law rather than the urban textual tradition of Islam. This is an old idea that historians have tried to advance, I have to say it, but uh, yes. They have pointed out that, in, for example, in Indonesia, the adat, or the customary law, was really what mattered. And that Islamic law was usually confined to the religious sphere, that is to say, dietary things or religious issues such as prayer or blasphemy, whatever. Uh, but um, what really mattered in uh, Indonesia in general, the Ada, which differed from region to region. I think this is true for the entire Islamic, Indo-Islamic world. Much more focused on customary law and therefore Indian patterns. So it's not so dominated by an urban textual tradition as the Middle East has been. So this is my first somewhat radical conclusion, perhaps. It may sound more radical than it really is because in the written version of this argument, I put in a lot more nuance. When I summarize it like this, it may sound a bit simplistic, perhaps, or apodic apodictic, but um, you, if you summarize, yeah, this is what happens. You lose the detail. But this is essentially what I'm trying to say, there, that we are moving away from the Middle East, an, an urban, ancient, imperial tradition, and that in India we do not really have that. And this has shaped the development of the Indo-Islamic world from the beginning until the end. <coughs> okay. That was the first. Now let me move on to the second conclusion. Um, I already said that India is a, was developed largely as a rural or urban culture where cities and villages were sometimes very hard to distinguish. Angkor, for example, there were rice fields in the middle of the city, in the center of the city, enormously important agriculture in the city. Very hard to say whether this is a, a huge village with lots of stone monuments, temples, and embankments and so forth, or whether it's just like 20 villages put together. It was very impressive from the point of view of temple building. But there, it was hard to say that this is a city. It's very hard to say what a city really is here. So a rural civilization. Uh, my second point is that this developed largely as a settled civilization in medieval times, in ancient times. It's one of the reasons that we do not have empires of the kind that the Roman Empire represented. Because my thesis here is that the settlement of large part of India, with the exception of the Indus area, largely medieval. And this goes against what I would call classical Indology. Uh, classical Indology is not like this idea that um, India, as we know it today, developed in the Middle, East, Middle Ages, not in ancient times. Everybody wants to have an ancient culture, of course. People want to have an urban imperial culture, even though they are against imperialism today. But, um, and then they want it to be old, as old as possible. And it's true that in Indian culture, the origins of almost everything are indeed very old. For example, the origins of the so-called caste system, yes, you can say that it's extremely old. Go way back to the Vedic period, there are there is some evidence of some kind of a caste ideology, whatever you want to call it. Yes, the origins go way back. But that doesn't mean that uh, everything developed in ancient times. 
origin is very different from widespread existence. So yes, we have settlement and we have agriculture already in uh, the Indus Valley times, Neolithic times, starting perhaps 4th, 5th century BC. But in most of this uh, area, the spread of agriculture on a big scale goes back to the 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th centuries AD. That's my second thesis. The actual process of agricultural expansion and the growth of settled culture in very large parts of South and Southeast Asia did not really gain momentum until the early medieval centuries. And it is at that time, I think, that we can get, we, we get the first real empires. So in my view, it's not the Mauryas, the Guptas, that are really the first empires, but the Gurjara Pratiharas, for example, the Rashtrakutas, and other early medieval dynasties, such as the Pala, I would consider these true empires, in a sense, because they had an agricultural resource base. They were based on a landed economy of great uh, complexity and uh, productivity already. And that is a, an early medieval development to a large extent, although not entirely. And certainly the Indus area is an exception, as always. So why did um, settled civilization um, develop developed so late in monsoon Asia? That is the question, if this is correct, what I'm saying. So I try to find the reasons for that. Um, in my opinion, it was much more difficult to bring um, the wet monsoon, uh, co the, the sort of monsoon uh, area of um, Asia under cultivation. It was much more difficult to clear the land. Uh, you can see in, in, in the Indus area, this was pretty easy. You could easily you could actually do it with bronze tools. That's why we have early agriculture there. But in all the other parts, we don't, do not have those soft, soft soils like in Sindh or the Indus area. There it is much more difficult to advance agriculture. And so it has been taking more time. It also has something to do with um, the disease situation. The demographic growth of most of Asia was relatively slow because of the presence of uh, all kinds of diseases there. This makes the region also somewhat unique, as, uh, for example, William McNeil has also pointed out, the proximity of certain animals and, and uh, human settlement has um, created a situation in which endemic diseases slow to down demographic growth. That is another reason why the settled civilization in uh, the Indic area developed relatively late and relatively slowly. Once it did so, it became more productive than any other part of the world, with the possible exception of parts of China. So, I argue here in the second, this is the second argument, the medieval origins of modern India, which is not to say that the ancient times were not important, but if you, know, you talk about settled civilization and the spread of many institutions that we now consider Indian, that's really the Middle Ages you have to look at. For example, um, monumental temple building. You cannot find monumental temples in ancient times. Angkor is for example, medieval complex, the biggest in the world, yes, but it is a medieval complex. Uh, um, Indian temples were medieval. I don't think there are any ancient temples. But when you look at the window here, in, uh, I'm in Athens at the moment. You can see the uh, Acropolis. Yes, this is ancient monumental architecture. And it goes back to the 5th century B B uh, BC and earlier. But we do not have monumental temple building in the Indic area until medieval times. It seems to suggest that monumental stone temples go together with peasant economies and developed agricultural economies which is a, a point that many people have pointed out. 
uh, in the Indian, the Indian temples are very important in the medieval period, and they all context is quite developed. There simply was no such developed, settled rural context, the such a surplus that could generate that kind of agricultural, uh, that, that kind of architectural abundance. So all the important temples that uh, you find in Indian art history books, they go back to the 8th, 7th centuries, at, or 6th at most, but not much more. There's hardly anything even in the Gupta period, a little bit, but the really big temples are, um, well, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, really. Medieval, in other words. Yeah, so settled monarchies, monumental temples, settled society, uh, agricultural economy, and even caste, in my opinion, are essentially things that develop, uh, gain momentum and develop in the medieval period. Though we have already a caste order mentioned in the Vedic text, I don't think India had a caste system in the Vedic times, but it did have it in the medieval times. So in my view, caste is it's not, neither an Orientalist construction of the British, nor is it very old. It's a medieval thing. I consider all these things medieval. It, it accompanied the rise of settled society. Very fine differentiation of professional occupations and uh, religious distinctions. It is uh, the product of um, settled society, in my opinion. And therefore, it did not really develop in ancient times. <clears throat> okay, that was the second conclusion, which may also sound slightly exaggerated, but I don't think it is. I'm not trying to be provocative, uh, but I have to summarize it, so it may sound a bit uh, simplistic. Let me move on to the third uh, conclusion. Which is the main um, thesis of, uh, my, of this book. Uh, so the driving force of Indo-Islamic history are not cities, no. But the driving force really um, comes from the changing relationship between mobile populations or nomads and seafaring populations and the settled society. So I think that is what we have to look at. And this is not something that should come as a surprise. We all know that in the history of Asia, uh, from uh, Turkey to China and Korea, nomads have been very important over many centuries. The Russians know this, the Middle East is unthinkable without nomadic studying nomads for India. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then of course we have um, nomads over an enormous area from uh, Manchuria all the way to uh, the Russian steppes, the enormous area. And it goes on in the Middle East, all the way to the Sahara, what people sometimes call the Great Arid Zone. So the relationship between the Great Arid Zone, Sahara, Asian Arid Zone, called, and the settled river plains, that's where I try to look and find driving forces of major change. And um, then we have, of course, the mobile population, the sea, which in my analysis is similar to the uh, great steppe and desert lands. The Indian Ocean is almost the same size, yeah, and, and, and in any way very large as this Sahara Asian arid zone. And I consider them comparable because they both have mobile populations that um, uh, thrive on uh, animal farming or uh, some relationship with the animal world, fishing and, uh, or um, raising livestock in case of nomads or steps. So the geographical distinction that I bring up here is not between land and sea. No. The, the distinction of land and sea goes back to the Bible, yes. First book of the Bible, God created the land and he created the sea, etc. 
I think that distinction, uh, well, it's certainly a valid distinction in other ways, but for historical purposes, that distinction is pretty useless. I would say the distinction that I try to advance here is that between settled society, settled agricultural society, and the frontier of mobile people, which can be uh, land nomads or seafaring people, <clears throat> these have in common that they, are, they have to move around to survive. So uh, the frontier of mobile uh, wealth, mobile populations, <clears throat> is um, juxtaposed, opposed to <clears throat> the settled world. And it is the changing relationship between these mobile populations <clears throat> and the settled peasant society that are uh, demographically far, far more uh, important, that is what I think the key factor we have to look at in uh, the history of um, the Islamic world. And here I, I come back to that point that I made at the beginning that text can be misleading because when you read the, uh, the texts, they are the texts of settled society usually, that look at the mobile population with contempt. Barbarians, in other words. Uh, the Chinese do that, the, um, the Greeks did that, the Indians do it more. In Sanskrit texts, these are impure populations of the desert or the sea, and they are considered barbaric, or beyond the scale of civilization even, and certainly beyond the pale of settled society or the caste in medieval times. So this, if you look at those texts, you will be misled, because these mobile populations, even though they are fairly small compared to the vast agricultural masses in the plain, they are actually a, this major source of dynamism in these areas. <clears throat> and you cannot figure that out if you um, stick with the interpretation that our settled or the texts have been uh, advancing law books and so forth um, give you a very um, misleading impression uh, about the importance of the no mobile populations. <clears throat> you only have to keep in mind, for example, uh, reflect on how people looked at the Mongols. These were not considered civilized people. These were uh, in, med in medieval Latin texts, they are described as not as people, but as beasts of coming out of hell. That's why they're called Tartars. They come out of hell. They have a very bad, so they got a very bad press. And, and for good reasons. I mean, they've been very destructive. Also. But um, <clears throat> my point is that um, the relationship between nomadic society and civil society is very complicated and not always destructive. And it has been a very important one in the history of India and Asia in general. So why is it that this um, frontier of mobile populations become, becomes more important in medieval times, not yet in, uh, for example, in ancient times? That was the question that I also wanted to ask. Um, here again, I have tried to uncover some geographical and environmental factors that have contributed to this fact, this, this historical change that was very really transformative. Um, and uh, you may have heard about this period of medieval global warming that played a big role in uh, migration, particularly in uh, the early medieval and up to the 13th century in particular. The so-called medieval warming period is now considered to have been responsible for widespread nomadic migration, even to some extent that of the Mongols. But that was certainly a factor that I have taken very serious. Uh, but there are others. Uh, overpopulation in the steppes, for example, uh, was a very big problem. You cannot have many people living in the arid zone because the, the resources are very limited. So a few million people in this arid zone could already uh, be a, a situation of overpopulation, whereas you can easily pack 100 million people in the northern Indian plain. This is very easy. Uh, there are 100, maybe 100 million people living in the North Indian 13th century, or whatever, 65 million, uh, enormous number. 
but there may have been three million nomads in uh, in the whole of Eurasia, not much. But it, they may have been in a situation of overpopulation already then, especially when global warming began to affect the grassland. That's why I would say all of the, our demographic uh, pressure has also been a factor. And in addition, there were military and technological factors, in, in particular the invention of the stirrup and so on, and a new weapons on, among the nomads. And then political and organizational change that made it possible to centralize nomadic empires where they were formerly tribally uh, divided. So all these factors come together in uh, the medieval period and they create a situation in which these nomadic people are able to establish dominance over the uh, river plains in Asia. And the same is true for many of the uh, seaboard societies. For example, uh, the southern Arabian coast suffered from great drought at the time. And um, there's great migration, for example, from the Arabs to Indonesia and the, in the coast of India and, and, and Africa in the same period. So a great deal of dynamism in medieval times uh, generated from within the, this arid zone and from uh, the coastal areas of the Indian Ocean. That, I think, is the key to uh, the medieval history of that area, not the growth or development of cities. Cities are not the drivers of Indian history. That's what I'm trying to say. The changing relationship with mobile population, that is what really drove this process. But for that, you don't, do not need cities. <clears throat> now, um, very interesting thing. This is the fourth conclusion that I um, have advanced. Um, these mobile populations expand their power um, under the aegis of Islam. They didn't have really any religion before. Yeah, shamanism, whatever that may be. The uh, nomads have not produced a single major world religion. But they have adopted them all. So uh, you see the expansion in medieval times of these mobile populations in the Middle East and in Central Asia, uh, and also the seafaring population. And they also adopt Islam, which is the religion of mobility. You can take it with you. That is what I have tried to argue with. Force, this is my fourth conclusion. The nomadic populations move to a position of dominance over all the agrarian core areas, and they create what we may call post-nomadic states, which are not just agriculture, but are rather um, establishing sort of political structures there that are more powerful than before. So there is a horse warrior revolution in medieval times, like in so many parts of the world. That's because the nomadic people um, they do not practice nomadism in India. You can't. Yeah, you can in, in the Indus area, but in monsoon Asia, you cannot have that kind of nomadism. But you can have horses, and you can have a horse warrior revolution initiated and sustained by these immigrating nomadic, post nomadic people. So we get the development of uh, Islamic sultanates in that con context, Delhi sultanate and its offshoots that were all created by such horse-riding uh, post-nomadic elites, Turks, for example, or, or even Mongols, and Afghans as well, many others, uh, that were formerly considered to be beyond the pale of settled society, but who have adopted Islam as their culture, as their religion. Uh, Islam also spreads uh, along, among the coastal populations, Again, the coastal population are not very numerous, but they are open in many ways to, um, if they're mobile, and they're also open to Islamization. That is really um, quite well known. Malabar, for example, or in Indonesia, you have the same thing. All, uh, all across the Indian Ocean, and uh, in, at every, in, with all the seaboard, in medieval times, more or less, is um, developing under the aegis of Islam. 
<laughs> so what about the rest? Um, was there conversion? Yes. But I, I would say, uh, my, just to put it in simple terms, there was no conversion in, among the settled populations in Hindu India, except when the settled populations were, <coughs> say, um, <coughs> except when these caste hierarchies and, and the settlement were um, unsettled. That's to say, if the caste hierarchies and structures of settled society were um, destroyed over time, then there would be, uh, it would be one factor that we could contribute to the possibility that they might convert to Islam. We see that, for example, in the Indus area. The Indus area is the only area of India where you have mass conversion. Um, and this is an area that was um, in the 13th and 14th centuries more or less destroyed by Mongol invaders. The Mongols could enter that area because it allows pastoral nomadism on a big scale, like Iran does and like Anatolia does. And so in the 13th and 14th centuries, these Indus, Indus areas, which are now Pakistan and Kashmir, they were comprehensively destroyed by nomadic occupation over the course of at least two centuries. And that uh, destroyed also the ancient uh, centuries old Hindu culture in that area, including the caste hierarchies that we find, for example, in, uh, in places like Kashmir. So no massive conversion to Islam in any part of Hindu India, which had strong caste uh, hierarchy or whatever was really settled, but except in the Indus borderland, what is now Pakistan, because there these structures were destroyed over time by nomadic occupation. And that paved the way for the conversion, in my opinion, to, um, to Islam. Uh, the situation in East Bengal is a very different one. So there, there was no agriculture there until medieval times. The spread of the uh, Ganges eastward created the delta and so on. It was created at the same time that Islam was spreading there. Uh, the, uh, so there you have the creation of a completely new society, which also becomes predominantly Muslim. But it's very different from the area of the Indus. The Indus is the only area which is not on the coast, uh, which converted to Islam. And I, I think the reason for that, um, to some extent, a large extent, is the fact that the older caste and Hindu structures and Hindu religion that that area was actually quite uh, damaged, very badly damaged, in the course of two centuries of Mongol occupation and destruction. It was very serious. I gave this lecture on uh, the Kaiwan about this, so if you're interested, you can listen to it there. But um, from uh, even Kashmir, it says in uh, the text, uh, here the text are really reliable. Uh, it says that uh, it was completely destroyed after the war, the fourth Mongol occupation. So, widespread destruction of Hindu civilization occurred on the western periphery of the subcontinent. And in my view, that is one reason that we have um, relatively more conversion to Islam there. Normally, that did not occur. Um, in Indonesia, in, for example, Java, yes, we also have conversion, but it was not a, a caste system. And Indian culture in Indonesia was largely confined to the courts. At least that's the impression I tried to uh, convey, and that I think uh, is, existed. So um, this is what uh, Islam has to do with it. We have these mobile populations that are not uh, Muslim, and we have the coastal populations. And then we have conversion in areas where Hindu culture was not very strong or was destroyed. <laughs> and the Islamic culture of India is very different in, in many ways from um, the Near East. It is less textual, less based on texts. After all, how many people do you know Arabic in India? Not many. It's less textual, it's more based on customary law. 
it is actually based also more let's say um, saint worship in, in sin this is very much the case marginal textual tradition <coughs> but a very important tradition of uh, <coughs> holy man Islam, as I would call it you have saints and uh, peers and so on and these are um, worshipped although in uh, some forms of Islam it was totally taboo but that was the practice in medieval India very often even the religion of the uh, political elites, whether they were uh, Turks or Mongols or Afghans, was of that kind. Very <clears throat> so this is also what sets the Indo-Islamic world apart from uh, many parts of the Middle East, uh, much more uh, based on customary law. And uh, really reform movements that made um, <clears throat> that oppose this culture are uh, date back to the 19th century, not earlier. Even in Sindh, you don't have any reform movement <clears throat> that opposes this religion of uh, <coughs> saints and so on, uh, which is um, even today a fundamentalist, uh, uh, quote unquote, oriented or Wahhabite orientations of Islam. The Taliban destroyed these, uh, these shrines, for example, for that reason. Uh, we don't have that until the 19th century. In other words, we have a kind of a quasi cult of saints in many parts of India. Uh, and de facto, it's not all that different from the preceding traditions of Hinduism. There was quite a bit of overlap. They're very different from modern Islam, and we have some textual orientation of Islam in the, in the cities like Delhi. <clears throat> uh, but even there, I just, at least my argument, it was largely confined to the religious sphere, which is to say it has um, an impact on uh, dress codes, diets, uh, prayer, uh, uh, that kind of religious sphere. And uh, blasphemy was very uh, that sort of thing. And uh, that is important. But other than that, and certainly in the countryside, customary law or what is called the Adat in Indonesia, that was really what um, prevailed. So, <clears throat> that was the fourth thesis. Uh, now the final word, um, the fifth. Um, yeah, I, I, I argue in the last chapter, which is about, um, or last two chapters, Mobile India and also the uh, East India companies and the Portuguese. These are part of the um, very important part of the book, <clears throat> uh, up to about 1800. Um, I argue two things. One is that um, this frontier, this twofold frontier of the nomadic world and the, the ocean, did not become a closed frontier until colonial times. Only in the 19th century is the frontier closed. So this relationship founded on geographical, the, the prevailing geographical condition, this, this relationship with the mobile population and the ocean continues to exist up to the 19th century. And then it closes. I call that the closing of the frontier. But it does not close in all times. The Mughals were, in my opinion, um, similar. They were essentially, um, a horse riding elite, even though infantry and gunpowder weapons are also important. The fundamental, um, the constitution of the mobile empire basically essentially still founded on horse riding uh, post nomadic elite, and it was not a gunpowder empire, therefore. The idea that the Mughals were a gunpowder empire was advanced by the Hassan. In an old book uh, called The Adventure of Islam, as you may know, <coughs> one of the three gunpowder empires, the uh, Ottomans, and the Safavids, and the Indian Mughal Empire. He said these are more, these were more powerful than the medieval empires because they had gunpowder weapons. <coughs> Nobody believes that anymore. It's an old, old idea that is, I think, superseded. Gunpowder weapons certainly uh, were um, used in the 18th and 17th and 16th centuries, 
but the Mughal Empire essentially it was stronger than than preceding empires, but not for that reason. Um, it is essentially a, a culture still based on cavalry, and I, I would call it chivalry, a kind of aristocratic code of <coughs> horse riding elite that continues until the 18th century and is not replaced, uh, like in Europe, by an infantry army and gunpowder weapons. So India remains a chivalrous society until the 19th century, where uh, a great deal of formality and, um, and chivalry, uh, chivalry is a very formal culture in many ways. And honor is an important concept in chivalrous society. It used to be in Europe as well. But in Europe, it is all replaced by infantry and gunpowder. I don't think that this is the case in India. The Mughals created a much more powerful empire because of all kinds of reasons that have to do with customary law. There are succession practices, as for example, is analyzed by Munis Faruqi very well, a really interesting book. I think one of the most important books in Mughal history, Munis Faruqi. Changes that were made to the succession practices in the Mughal dynasty allowed it to uh, consolidate its imperial um, forms of domination much more effectively than the Delhi There's nothing to do with gunpowder. <clears throat> this is the argument I'm trying to make here, that the Mughal Empire is still uh, exists in the case in the situation of open frontier. The same as the maritime world, the Portuguese in the 16th century, and then the British and Dutch East India Company do, do not put an end to the Islamic trade. On the contrary, the trade of the Indian Ocean, even in non-European hands, increases in the 17th, 16th, and even in the 18th centuries. Before the colonial states, <coughs> that was the situation. An open, open maritime frontier, in other words, in which the these India companies play a role, but they do not destroy or uh, terminate what we might call indigenous trade. So the open, the open maritime frontier also continues to exist until uh, very late, like late in the 18th century. <clears throat> the closing of the twofold frontier was essentially the result of 19th century colonialism, both in Indonesia and in India. It's also the time that the nomadic frontier closes, and um, indeed we get um, the rise of uh, uh, gunpowder weapons then, and a whole, wholly different, a completely different situation, where um, geography is no longer destiny because we are now talking about modern times. In my analysis, geography is destiny, yes, until modern times, and that had to do with this open frontier. Uh, and the uh, active uh, role that was played by mobile populations of the maritime world and of the uh, nomadic world, which was shaped all the, always by environment and geography, though played in uh, settled society, uh, the role of catalysts, in which, during which everything expanded, agriculture, trade, and so on, and, then, and also uh, population expansion occurred. Uh, this is what I call the open frontier, uh, is not closed until colonialism. That's when um, destiny is no longer uh, shaped by geography. That is the, thesis, the fifth thesis of the book, and also the last one. So um, I have a little epilogue there, uh, how um, it all changes in modern times. I would like to write my, an entire book about this. I am not a great fan of modern times, as far as these things are concerned. <laughs> um, it has many advantages too, of course, but uh, what happens in this world is really the, it's, it sort of becomes very artificial boundaries that have no meaning at all. For example, uh, the Durand line or uh, the boundary of uh, the Dutch East Indies and Malaysia. These are part of the same world, but they are uh, cut off in segments that make no sense at all historically. So the colonial world is artificial, 
and in that world, geography is no longer that. And the interplay of various populations is disturbed. That's why I don't like it. And I would like to work this out in more detail, but I have a little epilogue in it as well. Okay, well, I have talked long enough. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Pink. Um, thank you. Uh, any any questions, or should we go on to the next speaker? Uh, Ma'am? Yeah, am I audible? Uh, I can hear you. Yeah, so this is Jimia. I can hear, yeah. I can hear anything. Yeah, so this is Jimia uh, from uh, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, IIT Kharagpur. Uh, and so I was actually trained in the discipline of history and then later switched on to environmental history and then finally I am now pursuing environmental humanities. And I am definitely familiar with your works because of course as master's uh, students, we had to go through your books, uh, which are of course amazing. Uh, I'm sorry that I did not uh, came across your last book, uh, which I think came out last year. Uh, but of course, I'm familiar with your other works on the Marathas and al uh, and all. So coming uh, to today's lecture, the question well, I didn't hear the last sentence because it faded out. Can you please repeat your question. Uh, to an extent, you are also complicating the revolution. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can. Yeah. You, you're back. Uh, please repeat yeah, your sorry. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yes. Yeah, if you so, repeat it uh, briefly and uh, slowly, then it, uh, because uh, there are some kind of uh, atmospheric disturbance. Yes. So the question is like, uh, for example, uh, you talked about this uh, urbanism or, you know, the concept of yeah. urban which I think is yeah. also very important uh, in terms of contemporary urbanization as well, because it uh, yeah. dismantles uh, the boundary between the urban and the rural. So we also read in, uh, you know, uh, in our history uh, topics and themes that this agricultural revolution and urban revolution, these two are actually uh, connected. They are deeply connected. And there is this 10-point uh, model, uh, which was offered by Gordon Child, I think it's a seminal work uh, which came up in town planning review in the 1950s. And uh, that, so what I want to know from you is that, uh, did you also apply uh, any typological framework or methodology when you compared, you know, uh, this urban civilizations in Rome and Middle East and India? So this is the first question. The last question is that uh, you talked about, you know, uh, the reason behind conversion and also, you know, this uh, distinction between Settle uh, communities and mobile communities. So my question is also that you know, uh, uh, apart from the northern or north frontier narrative, you also uh, have like uh, regional narrative. So for example, uh, I am thinking in terms of Eaton's work, featured uh, Eaton's work, uh, Islam and the rise of the Bengal frontier, where he talks yeah. about you know uh, the different uh, 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 reasons uh, due to which conversions actually took place including social liberation. So what would be your uh, take on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Very good questions. Uh, may I uh, talk, um, answer the, first, the, the second one first? Yeah, I, I agree with um, this analysis of Bengal that is provided by uh, Richard Eaton. Um, there is um, a difference, however, with the Indus area, which was settled it was a very early, um, which had a very early development of settled agriculture, the earliest in the subcontinent. So I don't think you can compare <laughs> Bengal with, um, uh, with the uh, Indus area. In that sense, I disagree with Eaton. But his analysis of Bengal, I could, I, I'm very much in favor of it. It has something to do with, like I said, the shift of the river to the east and uh, the creation of the delta. Um, Islamic states were created, and there was no religion before, except the tribal culture. So yes, I agree with that, and um, that is certainly very important. The city argument is, uh, 
something that I keep thinking about, partly because now I live in Athens. And in European history, there's this idea that cities are overwhelmingly important. The motor of history are cities. In Mediterranean history and European history, the city was always the first thing. The drivers of modernity, progress, etc., etc. And then you have Western history is presented as a renaissance of, of Rome and, and, and Greece. This paradigm, which was advanced by European historians over the last few centuries, uh, in my opinion, um, does not help you understand the development of Indian settlement very much. And it has been uh, shaping that interpretation of Indian history, in my opinion, too much. Uh, the idea that, that everybody must be looking for great empires in their past and cities that are bigger than any other, I think it is a, a typical colonial legacy. Why would you have, want to have a Roman empire? Not, not necessary. Uh, if it didn't exist, it didn't exist. There's nothing to be ashamed about, I don't think. And uh, nowadays, people don't have this sort of imperial orientation very much anymore. But in the British times, yes, they were spellbound, as I said, by their Roman antecedents. They were even better than the Romans. In view. You listen to people like Curzon, and Churchill, and so on. They always felt they were like super Romans or something. And everybody who didn't have that Roman mindset uh, somehow were presented as weak or inferior. I think it's a completely wrong footing to begin with. And uh, Indian history uh, should be seen in its own term. And um, I think the ancient period of Indian history is very important, but it didn't have something like a Roman Empire. Don't make it look like Ashoka or uh, Augustus. There's no evidence for that. Ashoka was interesting in many ways, but it was not a Roman-like structure. It was not even like a Persian Achaemenid empire. So in my view, um, yes, there were many empires in Italy, but not in ancient times. At least they were not like that. And cities, um, well, I, this to me came as a surprise. This is another thing, nationalism, wants you to believe that there were great cities in India that were bigger than London. Yeah. Kanauj, for example, Kanyakut, the, the medieval city of Kanauj in North India, sometimes presented in the older literature as, oh, it was bigger than London. Yeah. Who cares? Why would it be bigger than London? Is it necessary? But it was, of course, destroyed by all these environmental factors that I mentioned just like Angkor Wat, and, and actually thousands of other places of which we don't know the names. Uh, I, I really think that um, this is one of the things that make Indian history interesting. The enormously important development of agriculture, and we have monumental architecture in a rural context. These uh, great temples, they may be in the middle of rural areas, not necessarily in cities, can be. So um, this overturn, uh, this uh, turnover of urban and urban centers, and the fact that um, these cities were mostly urban, although to some extent Mediterranean cities also had that. Even in medieval Italy, you can see that there was a certain amount of agriculture in the city. But nonetheless, this contrast between the Western city, the Polish of Greece, and the idea that these cities last forever. The city of Athens is about um, 3,000 years old. And you can see it everywhere. The ruins are everywhere, of all periods. So and this is the idea that cities last forever and they're the driving force of history. I don't believe this is the case in monsoon Asia at all. Even though architectural accomplishments are very important in the context of temple building and so forth, uh, I do not think that uh, urbanism uh, was a major driver of Islamic development, for example, in India. And uh, it's interesting to study uh, close 
medieval city where the Kali sort or Delhi. As you know, Delhi was actually emptied out in the, the time of Muhammad bin Tukul. Everybody had to go to Allahabad, and there was nobody left. This is another example of uh, what happens in Indian urbanism. They could be abandoned, and then there was nobody, nobody left, and maybe forever. So this is very important that we do not try to emulate the, the Mediterranean or the European. I think it's important that although the British would make it look like if you do not have these things, you are somehow second. You're not important if you don't have a Roman Empire. I think that should be forgotten. And um, that is what I would call decolonizing Indian history. Uh, look at what is there rather than what is not there in comparison with uh, the rest. The British also, by the way, did not uh, have a Roman Empire. In fact, it was a big disaster, the Romans. In... <laughs> you cannot say that the British were the descendants of the Romans. It's a ridiculous idea. But look at their buildings. They all have these uh, Greek and Roman uh, monumental features. And they made everybody look like they were like super Romans. And that it was their destiny in the wake of Rome to rule the world. So um, that is why urbanism and empire, Roman style empire building became prestigious. It was imposed on um, the rest of the world by the colonial of, uh, overseas empires of Europe. And to this day, people have been trying to find <coughs> great empires in the past of, uh, of India. I don't see uh, how anybody can say that about Ashoka. Uh, we, now, we now think that, for example, um, the yeah, Ashokan pillars are religious, okay? Their, their content is only religion, which is interesting. And they're beautiful works of art, Ashokan pillars. Uh, but there's nothing in there about administration. This is something that uh, everybody can see for themselves. And then um, the so-called Kautilya Arta Shastra is now believed to be uh, something of the 4th or 3rd century AD. Uh, it used to be seen as the product of the empire, but nobody thinks that anymore. <coughs> uh, Megasthenes, who is another eyewitness of the Maurya Empire, he doesn't say it is an empire. He never says that. Even though I think Megasthenes is unreliable anyway, he had never said that it was like an empire. So we don't have any evidence that there is some kind of a empire, a Roman style empire at that time. Even the Guptas, no way. It, it does, you, you can get that in the early medieval Indian subcontinent. The Gurja Pratiharas, the, the, the Rajputs, and so on. Those are empire creators. Uh, and that's because the settled society at the time is more developed. But it has nothing to do with ancient cities. There are no ancient cities in India, even Benares, yeah. In Benares, Varanasi, you can see the, the earliest archaeological finds there are in 4th century AD. And everything that is built, the, the waterfront, with the secret picture, that goes back to the 16th, 17th century or later. And yes, there is a certain amount of urbanism in Benares from ancient times, but that's because it is a, an exception. It was built on hard, uh, kind of a hard rock, kind of, uh, which is very different from the alluvial um, soft soil around it. And this is an exception. And this is one reason why there's more urban longevity in Varanasi than anywhere else. Normally, the alluvial plains were soft, and there was no way you can have cities there that last for 2,000 years, like Athens and Rome, or many others that people have uh, identified in there. Or even Constantinople, which is an early medieval city that lasts forever. It's still there. So. Um, this is a very important um, thing for me, at least, that you do not conceptualize Indian history by looking at um, the ancient Mediterranean. It's very different settlement history. But people have been doing that for nationalistic reasons, and the British have done that. So I think this is a very important thing to abandon. Is that a long enough answer? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I would say, I would say uh, if you want an even longer one, you should read those chapters. <laughs> Thank you. Lavanya, uh -huh. 
this is anuradha here can i just uh, i just had one uh, uh, another angle to this entire discourse of you know whether it's there or not whether there were something like an was something like an empire mine is more from a linguistic perspective and i don't have any expertise sufficient expertise to really know the thing but i was just curious in sanskrit we have the term samrajya so empire not, yes it's trans no yeah yeah so i'm just no, I mean, uh, yeah what, so yeah, we have the term, yes so i'm just wondering yeah, whether yeah. It, it and these terms are well defined what do they mean by a samrajya is a well defined thing now i don't have it off my head like that but it would be worth investigating whether these linguistic because language is another a carrier of historical uh, you know events and historical yeah. uh, realities so yeah. i'm just wondering whether that that's, is something that you have investigated and whether what are your findings on those lines that's that's what um, professor wink is suggesting we have to come out of this fish ideals of uh, roman ideals of uh, empire cities and we have to come up with our own ideas of what india was what indian yeah. cities were at our structures so we have to yeah. develop our own uh, structures and the understanding of our past we cannot yeah. compare we cannot have comparative analysis yeah it's uh, that, that's a excellent point uh, and that's um, yeah i i think that uh, for example uh, people in african history have also fallen into this trap you read uh, henry louis gage junior his book is called uh, uh, some very lavish production of africa in which you constantly um, are told that in the 11th century the biggest empire in the world was in africa and then everybody suddenly wants empires uh, though we have also decided that empires are bad people nowadays are all against empires okay but uh, then they must have them in their past well, isn't that a bit of a contradiction i don't think that anybody should be ashamed of not having a roman empire in their past brutal so if, you, if you put it that way you can actually look at indian history in a, in a different way but the the art which is rex and in indo european languages it sort of begins in the veda there was always rule but it was on a scale and then you have of course ritual networks for example the guptas they had a very important ritual sovereignty over a large area oh sorry um they can be seen as a sort of overlords but in a ritual sense i don't see any evidence that they were collecting the troops from gujarat or something or that they were collecting their money and so this is the thing you have all kinds of structures that um that are presented as a uh, raj or royal domains and so on, but they're not empires of the roman style empires so i think um it's a different style of empire it's it's an empire it's a samrajya but it function more as a confederacy rather than unified empire it's a confederacy of different yeah. societies so we have to yeah. look at our own evidence and we have to develop our own path on how to yeah, yeah. political <laughs> political traditions and political yeah. theory are um going way right back but um and there exactly you can see why it's different uh, it is very simple but if you are stuck in this mindset that everything has to be like the roman empire or it is deficient then you have a problem yeah we we cannot come out of the uh, the colonial paradigms if we stick to that yeah I, i think this is what decolonizing history should be it, uh, yeah you don't you don't try to um, look at it in that way and i'm also just wondering if it has to do with the extent of development Is it Anuradha ji, I yes, think we sorry. should uh, close this discussion here because another speaker is waiting, and our first session was supposed to go on till ten thirty. I think we are running a bit late, so my yes. suggestion is yes. to come back to this in the open session. We are going to have time later on, so let us defer some of these uh, questions till later. It was a uh, fascinating presentation. I learned so much. indeed very very grateful i have a bunch of questions myself but uh, i think that we could uh, request uh, uh, lavanya ji to invite our like, speaker for the morning professor pankaj jet and uh, if okay. uh, so wing uh, doesn't mind waiting a bit 
then in the <laughs> session immediately after, we will return to some of these extremely important themes and ideas uh, which have come up in your in your uh, uh, presentation. And I'm only wondering whether uh, just one thing I wanted to clarify: the 2020 Cambridge University Press book is it a one volume? Uh, uh, a collection of the three volume books with the no, same title? No, no. Okay. no so basically a um, very short uh, summary of all, all the five volumes. But um, um, it, it tries to sort of uh, unclutter the argument. It's the uh, uncluttering of my previous books. Okay, because uh, the title I mean, is similar. The title was similar, so I was confused. The title seemed similar, Making of yeah. the Indus World. Yeah, but this covers, this covers all the other volumes for um, an American audience that is, uh, as, uh, all, all American audiences are in a hurry. And um, as you know, um, uh, the American edition of Proust in Search of Lost Time is also one volume. So uh, for this reason, I thought that uh, I should write a very short book which was very difficult, but um, it is not the different from the longer version, but it's much uh, shorter. So I look forward to reading that. The longer uh, yeah. I you have them, I, you can I haven't got to reading them. They're voluminous, so we look forward to well, reading this. Yeah, you can get this on Kindle. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. much cheaper than the other one. <laughs> But if you don't mind waiting, a, 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 you know, another half hour or 40 minutes, then we can resume this conversation. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. The... I am, uh, uh, I'm, I'm done and I don't want to take more time. Okay. So, Lavanya Ji, let's to, to Pankaj Ji. Uh, you know, yeah. I think we all know him. We need to introduce him in great detail. But uh, yes. just to welcome him. Uh, yes. And I can see your cat also uh, in the background. <laughs> yeah. thank, but, thank, uh, you so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Mr. Governor Ji welcomes you. I want to welcome you myself. Okay. Uh, Pankaj Ji, can you, can you see us, hear us? Yes, yes. Oh, hi. Perfect. And Sister Manalis, can you please mute Professor Wink's uh, mic? Because he stepped out and it's still, uh, there's a background noise. So I, I'll make just a two-sentence introduction to Professor Jain and then hand over to him. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Pankaj yes. Jain is a well-known religious studies and anthropological scholar uh, in the United States. Currently, he is teaching. Uh, he is professor and head of Indic studies at Flame University. His work, uh, his books are well-known. Uh, his uh, research on environmental history uh, is well-known. Um, he visited uh, Shani State University uh, a few years ago and uh, uh, his lecture on uh, the practice of Bishnoi and the environmental uh, concern uh, is very well received. So Professor Pankajan's work on uh, environmental ethics and social ethics is well known. Uh, so I invite him to speak, uh, Professor Pankajan. Thank you, Lavanaji. Thank you, Mukranji. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Today I'm speaking, uh, presenting on a, you know, one of the most popular and controversial and much discussed topic of Varna system and uh, Jati system, caste system and whatnot. You know, so many terms and categories we can analyze it. Uh, uh, I have also shared the, just a link to a shortened version of this talk, which is already published on Huffington Post, which is I just shared on the on the chat window, uh, and I want to share my PowerPoint also, if I can, let's see. If I Please can go ahead. Uh, yes, I think they should do it. Yeah, all right. Okay, so, yeah, so Varna Jati, caste, and Ambedkar, so many things I have to talk, but I don't know how much time I'll, I have. I'll try to go as fast as I can. Uh, first slide is just a summary of the last one's few trusts uh, uh, survey that they conducted with thousands and thousands of Indians. And what we find is that caste system or caste identification, scheduled or scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, is really present in all of the different traditions within India. Now, general population is only 30% Hindus. 20. So general category is mostly by Hindus and Muslims. 
Christian Sikhs and Jains, but on the scheduled caste, so scheduled caste, there are now Hindus and but mostly Buddhists identify under that. Right, very less Jains though, but scheduled tribe mostly uh, Christians and Hindus also some and so on and then so so what we see in this summary at least, which I think matches our own uh, observations within India, this is by Pew Trust, Pew Research Center of America. That caste as a category, especially SC and ST in general, these three categories can be applied not just to Hindus, but to Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains all across India. And largely speaking, I think we can say all across South Asia. And even largely, if we extend this category, this is not just limited to India, not just limited to Hindus, but it's really is now in South Asia, uh, different traditions, you know, Southeast Asia, and even some other parts of Asia, and even largely even beyond Asia. Uh, also, I think just, uh, so I'm just sharing, I think a lot of things are maybe you know, kind of reminders. Uh, so this is a reminder from a French scholar, Georges Dumasil, who lived from 1898 to 1986, who brought us to, who, who developed this hypothesis called the tri-functional hypothesis, in which he saw this three tripartite completeness of society, as he called, which is present in Germanic peoples, Celts and Scandinavians, uh, Greeks and Germans, Romans, Hittites, Persians, Russians, Indo-Aryans, largely entire Indo-European uh, land, if we can say, or even proto-Indo-European people, in which he saw that some gods or goddesses can be categorized under the wisdom category. So in which the Roman or Greek gods such as Zeus or Jupiter, Mitra and Varun in India, and later on we say we know Saraswati in the you know, modern day contemporary Hinduism, Similarly, wars or deities of power and war, which are Mars in Roman category and Indra in the Indian Vedic system. In the, in, under the wealth category, which is the Vaishya, so Brahman, Kshatriya, and the Vaishya, the Vaishya gods or goddesses, uh, it bounties, deities, or those who are food producers, were in Roman culture as well. So Diana and Lucina and Flora and, and so on. And the Lakshmi, of course, in the contemporary Hindu system. So what we what I want to what we learn from this hypothesis is that this categorization of Brahman, Vash, Brahman, Kshatriya, and Vaishya is not just limited to Vedic culture or Hindu or Indian culture, but it's really coming from proto-Indo-European system, proto-Indo-Aryan, proto-Indo-European system in many, many cultures across the world, across Asia and Europe. So this, we tend to forget, I think at least I didn't know until I came across this hypothesis that caste system or even Varna system is not just limited to Vedic system or Hindu system or Indian, Indian culture, but it is really coming from all across the world, all across uh, Indo European, uh, Asia and Europe for, for sure. Right then, the, this is well known Purush Sukta, Rig Veda 1090, where Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra, we know the diff different divisions that were laid down in the Purush Sukta in the Rag Rig Veda. Uh, so, based on nature, aptitude, or action, division of labor based on duties, not rights, what we can probably hypothesize in, from this separation is that this may be the, one of the earliest divisions. As, or separation of church, state, and finance, as, as also we, we see that in, the, in other cultures also we have. So this kind of a separation of church, state, and money is very interesting. Now, this is very recent that now, because of uh, you know, secularism, church and state must be separate, but we see in this ancient system also, this kind of similar ideas can be, we can imagine maybe that was also going on. That's how Brahmins and Kshatriya and Vaishyas are all separate and given separate duties and roles to play. Uh, my longer article in Huffington Post has many, many, many different quotes, dozens and dozens of quotes from different Vedic and Sanskrit texts. But here, just there are some samples, Sanskrit quotes I would like to share, in which uh, Brahadarinik Upanishad says, and Mahabharata also says, that we were all Brahmins or all Shudras. We are all really all from one Varna until we develop certain qualities or certain traits. Right? In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, the fourfold Varna has been created by me according to differentiation of Guna and qualities. Chapter 4, verse 13, Manusmati says, just as a wooden toy elephant cannot be a real elephant and a stuffed deer cannot be a real deer, so without studying text and the Vedas and the development of intellect, a Brahmin by birth cannot be considered a Brahmin. Although Manusmati has been criticized for a uh, caste system, but here in this quote, at least, it seems pretty different and pretty open and very flexible and open system as Manusmati is telling us. Now, uh, I would want to present some of the Varna mobility examples, which were in which, for example, Vasishtha, we, we know, was born uh, as a son of a courtesan to uh, 
uh, and it he, and he emerges and you know modern contemporary Hindus definitely would uh, treat him as as a, one of the Brahmin rishis, uh, you know, ultimate example of Brahmin. Vishwamitra changes his varna from Kshatriya to Brahmin, as we know from Mahabharat and Puranic stories. Vyasa, who is credited with the you know, compilation or authorship of Vedas, the Mahabharat, the Puranas, was actually born, born as a son of a Shudra woman, and he emerges as one of the major Brahmin examples. Parashar, his, his father, Vyasa's father, Parashar, was also born as a son of a Chandal woman, and he emerges as a Brahmin Rishi. Palmiki was born in a Shudra uh, lineage, and now he's treated as a Brahmin, as an author of Ramayan. Janak, Raja Janak, uh, born as a Kshatriya, but because of his knowledge and his aptitude and so on, is accepted as Rajarshi. Vidura is Vidur in the Mahabharata, is born of a Shudra woman and, and treated as Brahmins. Kaurvas and Pandavas themselves were descendants of a Shudra woman and Brahmin men, right? And then, but they emerge and they are treated and they, by their, again, by their action, by their aptitude, they are treated as Kshatriya. So these are some examples of Varna mobility. Again, there are many, many more examples in my Huffington Post article, which I already shared. Uh, in our, re re you know, not so mythical history, but recent history, relatively recent history, Maurya, Chandrup Maurya and Ashoka and Shivaji were born in Shudra lineage, but later on, again, by their aptitude, by their actions, are treated as Kshatriyas. Kalidas, Tiruvalluvar, Kabir, Surdas, Ramdas, and Tukaram were not Brahmin by birth, but today I think we have no hesitation in accepting them as major Brahmin uh, authors, poets, saints, by their, again, by their actions, by their works, by their writings, and so on. And in modern day Indian history, in the last two centuries, I think I would, at least personally, I would uh, say that uh, Gandhi, Vivekananda, Aurobindo, Mahesh Yogi, Chirman, and none of them were born in Brahmin, well, our Brahmin families uh, by, by birth, but by, again, by their actions, by their character, by their thinking, I think we can treat them, or I think many do treat them as, as Brahmins or even Rishis. Uh, these are you saw all these examples of Varna mobility in ancient mythical history and and as well as in modern history. Uh, some more thoughts and summaries from different texts that I had to uh, research for uh, for this topic. And you, so jati and caste. So jati can be uh, also translated as kind simply that different jatis of people, different kinds of people, different types of people. Jatis may also refer uh, as endogamous community in which. Many indigenous communities, such as the, what we now might also call as tribes, later on developed and they were treated as one jati, right? So anthropologically speaking, Louis Dumont, the French scholar, he treated jatis as, uh, as economic division of labor, and maybe they were doing bartering, so that's how different jatis developed. Or uh, again, these are all hypotheses from Louis Dumont, the French scholar, and uh, maybe they also denoted some ritual purity, so that, Categorize different groups into different jatis. Then Mackie Marriott developed his own ethno sociological model at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, and in, 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 his, in his model, in his own ethno sociological model, he uh, perceived the entire culture as with these different categories of three, three doshas, which are also present in uh, Ayurveda, as we know three kaffas and kafpit and vata and three gunas, rajas, tamas, and sattva. And, and five elements of earth and water and fire and so on. That's what we project into our Varna system also, as Michael, Mackie Marriott, whose picture also you see in, on, on your right. Uh, that's what was his hypothesis. Uh, he preferred the word individuals rather than individuals, in which individuals, in which we see more interconnection across, at least across the jatis, rather than individual individuality or isolated model of a human being. What Jati's project is a individual model in which the interconnection is highlighted, not just you know self-isolated individual person in which many uh, Western models might be based on. But Jati's developed this individuals, not individuals. That was his hypothesis. Uh, then aspectual model also can be seen in in the, in the Jati system where mutuality, centrality, and hierarchy models uh, features of different Jatis can be also seen. Uh, of course, Nicholas Dirk's book Casts of Mind. Uh, argues and, and many uh, have accepted that the colonial effect was very strong, which led to the frozen set of rank groups before the colonial uh, census model. For example, Risley's census was the first time when the race science was projected on the, on the Indian system and the, the jatis were sort of frozen in this in these rank group. And that's what happened to uh, Indian population, largely speaking. And even after independence, we, we followed that same model 
in which uh, Risley ar argued that uh, he used the ratio of the width of a nose to its height to divide Indians into Aryans and Dravidian races, which is just, you know, sounds so, uh, uh, you know, really uh, surprising that, you know, how he divided Aryans and Dravidians based on the size of the nose, as well as seven castes. And caste today has, after independence, especially with the reservation system and, and whatnot, caste has emerged as a political identity in which Dalits and Mandal Commission, and now with uh, Narendra Modi being coming from OBC, it, it's sort of turning into all uh, all the caste uh, arguments into into it, over into its head. I think with uh, different pro different identities developing, exemplified by, by the prime minister himself. I think I would I would say. So these are some of the summaries of different uh, influential scholars uh, in Europe and America who who studied caste or jati from their own angles, their own models. Anthropology, ethnosociology, and colonial colonial study or historical study coming from Nicholas Dirks also. Uh, then the our own uh, one of the authors, major authors of our own Indian Constitution, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, and he developed he studied in U.S. and U.K. as we know, uh, and developed Indianized pragmatism, converted to Buddhism as we know also religion or what he called as religion of values. So, so he can he considered Buddhism as being more moral. And rational than Christianity, Islam, or even Hinduism. So he converted eventually to Buddhism, and he preferred the liberation theology coming from Buddhism, based on Buddhism, rather than violent Marxism. So he rejected Marxism and uh, chose liberation theology of as he perceived coming from coming from Buddhism. He also preferred Bodh Bodhisattva ideal, which was better than Theravada individualism. So Mahayana he preferred, Nirvana he compared with scientific rash rationality. Karma, he compared with theory of causation, cause and effect, uh, prajnya as rational wisdom, karuna as social justice. So he interpreted Buddhism from his own modern perspective and he criticized Manusmriti but admired Upanishads. He was against Aryan invasion theory and against Article 370, but he was, and he was for universal civil code. These are, these are all coming from Ambedkar. But what Ambedkar said about caste, caste or jati system is interesting, in which he rejected that nasal index. Uh, study that was coming from Rizli and colonial uh, colonial times, and according to Ambedkar, the measurements established that the Brahmin uh, and the untouchables belong to the same race. From this, it follows that if the Brahmins are Aryans, the untouchables are also Aryans. If the Brahmins are Dravidians, the untouchables are also Dravidians. If the Brahmins are Nagas, the untouchables are also Nagas. Such being the facts, the theory must be said to be based on a false foundation. That is, that is coming from Ambedkar, so in which he is really rejecting the model coming from the colonial times. Uh, seven misconceptions, which are very popular, caste uh, and, and their response, responses here in, in, very, in very fast and very short summary. Caste determines occupation, not as a rule. Today we know many, many castes have completely challenged and rejected their traditional occupations and doing different, people are doing different kinds of, of professions today, occupations. Caste designations are changeless. That, that also is not a rule. The designations can also change all the time, and they do change all the time, as we saw in some of the examples. Caste determines fixed hierarchies. This is also you know, to be rejected because they, are, are, they, they have been fluid and flexible all throughout the history. Caste determines relationships, but not the blood relationships. So that also is a, uh, you know, to be rejected. Caste is unique to Hindus that we already seen that all religious groups not just in India, but across South Asia and now across Asia and in beyond have accepted some kind of a hierarchy or, or even some kind of a caste based ranking kind of a system in, in different, different cultures and different communities in different countries. Caste is legitima legitimized by Hinduism, but the response to that is we know throughout the history reform movements, such as even coming from Kabir Nanak uh, and even Indian constitution rejects uh, and tries to critique the, the, whatever are the issues that are based on the castes uh, such as untouchability and so on that has been reformed and challenged and, and tried to reform by many, many of our reformers. Caste is abolished by Indian constitution. That is also uh, a misconception because untouchability and discrimination are definitely abolished, but not caste as such because constitution itself accepts scheduled caste and, and what and scheduled tribe, etc. Uh, does caste uh, encourages uh, social inequality? But we, we know that segregation is in all religions of societies, not just in Hinduism or not just in Hindu society. All castes, jatis are products of intermixing of different varnas and are thus equal. You know, I think probably the biggest example is Kaurvas and Pandavas, which are the mixture of two varnas of 
uh, uh, Brahmins and Shudras, and that and and then they are t t accepted as Kshatriyas. So 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 those kind of intermixing was has been happening for ages for for millennia in in the in the in, in the society. Uh, marriage issue jatis do prefer marrying within the jatis so this situation probably is more similar to probably based on the like linguistic similarity uh, a person of one language background may prefer to marry a person of similar language background rather than intermixing of languages which is just leads to more i guess uh, mismatch between one's background so that's that kind of matching does happen even in today's matrimonial examples if we see today's uh, english newspapers within india so jatis are definitely matched, but that's probably to match their backgrounds, their ling linguistic background, their regional backgrounds, and whatnot. So that does happen. Uh, nature or nurture? That debate is still going on. That you know that goes on still as we speak. So is uh, is the uh, aptitude or nature? Is it determined determined by one's DNA or by one's upbringing and training? That's that's what we is still to be decided and. Jatis have this, I think, in the some, some somewhere in the middle, it it, it sort of, uh, I think, it stays because some many times it happens that children of the same jati, same parent parenthood, would like to continue the same profession, but then they can change also based on the nurture, based on the upbringing and training and whatnot. So that's a, somewhere still a fl flexible and, and to be debated. You know, it's still arguable. Uh, corruption and distortions have happened, and we know that untouchability and, and everything. Etc. has been happening in Indian society and it still exists to some extent, but it has been again challenged, reformed by Hindu thinkers in every age. Kabir, Nanak, Swaminarayan, Arthur Swaminarayan is a great example, I think, which defies these these caste based or jati based hierarchies and created a new community called Swaminarayan. And Arthur did the same thing with Swadhyay, Nanak did the same thing with Sikhs, uh, trying to even take ideas from Hinduism and Islam. Kabir tried to challenge the same in a, in a similar way. And uh, untouchability, etc., has has already been banned by Indian constitution. So that, re like all societies, Hindu society also has a long way to go, and, and it's still trying to reform itself. Uh, some of the benefits. What can what can be seen as a benefit uh, of this of this jatis and and varnas and so on. So uh, one way to look at it probably uh, can be seen as when Jews came to Kerala in first century CE, Jews were almost treated like a separate jati. So Jews internal matters were never uh, challenged or never so the Hindu ways of rich, Hindu ways Hindu rituals for example were not forced upon Jews or not forced upon Christians who also have been living in southern India for 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 a long time Muslims have been living in India for a long time Zoroastrians have been living in India since eighth century CE so all the these different religious groups as they came to India the Hindu rituals or Hindu practices were not forced upon these different uh, outside religions uh, as they arrived in India. Probably because of jati system, so they were treated as their own jatis. They had full liberty, full freedom to practice their ritual, their myths, their traditions, their places of worship. Probably based on this, this jati system. Similarly, Greeks and Bactrians and, and Huns and Kushans, uh, they were also eventually apparently they were merged into the Kshatriyas, Varna, and again they were also they remained their own jatis for a long time until they were treated as as their own uh, as a as a jatis within the Kshatriya system. But the internal matters were never uh, are never the to be uh, forced upon by outsiders. Uh, and even Dalai Lama, I would say that you know, after the Chinese invasion, he has been living and his Buddhist community. Similarly, just as Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Zoroastrians have been living in India for centuries, now Dalai Lama has also been living in India, completely with complete liberty. And he, has, you know, Buddhist community has been also living in uh, India, many, various various parts of India uh, for for a long time now. And one of the example uh, I used to quote, uh, you know, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh became uh, the Prime Minister, and even a Sikh, Sikh minority, because of this uh, this freedom given to all minorities in India, even a Sikh emerged 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 and became Prime Minister and remained a Prime Minister for a long time. Uh, then, yeah, so castle mind colonialism and the making of modern India by Nicholas Dux uh, and the Western foundations of the caste system, uh, which came in 2017. These two, I think, are are the major uh, sort of challenges to the colonial model, uh, definitely. Uh, that are uh, to be for further reading, I would uh, suggest. At this point, I will stop and refer you again to my uh, longer piece in Huffington Post, whose article, whose link I've, I've shared in the chat window. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pankaj Jain. Uh, that was a very illustrative lecture um, about the basic 
concepts and how they changed and how you know <laughs> we have the concerns now um so uh, maybe let's open for uh, questions thank you for the great lecture <laughs> yeah i was just thinking uh, lavanya ji that we are already behind in schedule we were supposed to start at 10 30 11 6. so uh, why not we listen to uh, shonalika ji first if she's there okay. and okay. Uh, then we we are going into an open session so I mean, there are very many interesting points raised by Pankaji. We'll have to come back to that, right? Uh, including one area which dovetails with Professor Wink's point, as that conversion happened only when the social arrangements uh, were completely destroyed by, you know, Mongols and other nomadic uh, invaders. And the only other thing I wanted to say, just by way of a uh, comment to think about later, Pankaji, is the Pew survey so something fascinating to me that uh, the scheduled caste population is far higher than what the 2011 census shows. So this has two explanations. One is that actually there was underreporting in the 2011 census or that being scheduled caste is or being backward to so reverse Sanskritization of all these communities, especially scheduled caste and non Hindu communities, are not eligible for reservation. But the idea is that they all want to be uh, mm. identified as scheduled caste to get yes. res uh, reservation. Yeah. So there's much more going on in the Pew sure. survey than meets the eye. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I predict that backwardness is going to increase tremendously. <laughs> And there are uh, yes. some not so backward groups which are agitating today for backward status. Right. We won't name these groups. They're very powerful landed okay. groups. But anyhow, we leave that aside. And in South India, the Let last names were check dropped. if Shonalika is here. So there is a concern oh, yeah. about fake caste certificates and all that. Yeah. That's a completely different ball game. But I'm only saying that there are legitimately uh so-called uh, landed and other groups who are in a open agitation to be identified as backward in maharashtra there's an agitation in gujarat there was another agitation and uh you know, in, in andhra yes. telangana we've already seen and there are quotations where uh mobility of the kind that pankaji talked about has been listed uh in tamil nadu there's a verse which actually points to this that if so, and so such and such, he'll be there. And finally, they become a modeliar. You know, finally, uh, if they reach a certain level of prosperity, they are identified as modeliar. Anyhow, but I, I'm saying let's bracket out this. Sir, 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 वर्ण और जाति गतिशीलता तो भारतीय समाज में रही है इसमें कोई संदेह नहीं लेकिन मैं आपका ध्यान इस बात पर आकर्षित करना चाहता हूं कि यह नीचे से ऊपर के बजाय ऊपर से नीचे की ओर है यदि आप एक डॉक्यूमेंट हैं आप तो राजस्थान से हैं तो मर्दुम शुमारी 1981 जो मारवाड़ की मर्दुम शुमारी है उसमें ऐसे हजारों उदाहरण हैं जो ये कहते हैं कि जैसे ही आपने हथियार बांधना छोड़ा आप ऊपर से नीचे की ओर आ गए हैं ये धारणा बना ली गई है बहुत सारे क्षेत्रों में लेकिन ऐसा नहीं है इसका सबसे बड़ा उदाहरण है कि राजस्थान की क्षत्रिय जातों जातियों की सारी खापें उपजातियां दलित और जो हमारी बीच की जातियां उनमें भी मिलती है हाड़ा चौहान शिशोदिया ये सब मिलते हैं जैसे ही आपने हथियार जो बुनियादी कर्म है जो छोड़ा और आपको नीचे की श्रेणी में जाना पड़ा है ऐसे उदाहरण राजस्थान में बल्कि दूसरी जगहों पर भी बहुत कम है जहां नीचे से ऊपर की ओर गए एक बात आपने और कही है छत्रपति शिवाजी के बारे में मेरे पास ये गौरीशंकर ओझा का इतिहास है उनकी धारणा यह है कि हम्मी हम्मीर जब सत्ता रूढ़ हुए तो उनके दो भाई इससे बात से रुष्ट होकर दक्षिण में भारत के दक्षिण भाग गए 
और दक्षिण भारत के बहुत सारे राज्यों में ये सिसोदिया ब्रांच जो मेवाड़ की है उसका शासन है बहुत लंबे समय तक रहा मुझे लगता है कि इस बात पर आपका मैं आपसे थोड़ा आ, उत्तर चाहूंगा तो बता दिया सर काफी अच्छे से सारांश बता दिया आपने तो मोबिलिटी तो रही है और ऊपर से नीचे का मैंने नहीं बोला तो आपने वो भी ऐड कर दिया बस थैंक यू फॉर शेयरिंग बाद में डिस्कस करेंगे Uh, um, who is an associate professor at uh, JNU, and uh, I have uh, read her book on uh, the making of early Kashmir, landscape and identity in the Raja Tarangini, and uh, I think that uh, I learnt a lot from this book. Uh, you know, um, um, one of the things I learnt is that uh, uh, what I mentioned right at the start of our uh, discussions here that indian itihas or the writing of history was definitely linked with uh, uh, you know a kind of ethical dimension the purushartha as you may call it the panchama veda itihas purana being the panchama veda uh, and in kalhana also you see this because according to uh, dr call in his work there's a constant refrain he's very satirical he lampoons uh, uh, you know figures of political authority he lampoons and satirizes uh, religious authority but throughout what is his as it were guiding style, or what is his uh, you know criterion uh, in his it turns out it is uh, uh, praga anupana and quoting from her book prada anupalana and uh, uh, and what is he again he gets ja pidanam that is praja anupalanam is the welfare of the people and praja pidanam is the prosecute a persecution or oppression of the people and uh, uh, so i was trying to say that indian itihas uh, is defined by these objectives Uh, the glorification of heroes but their glorification is not mere glorification but it has a purpose and the purpose is to see the flourishing of the properties of the flourish human potential i and of dharma that is what the mahabharat at least is about and ramayana and we see uh, in our puranic literature this is my contention the so called native itihasa because look Itihas is only, uh, I mean, is, is thousands of years old in India. I mean, the Rig Vedas are a form of composition, which have some historical elements to them, at least going back to 3,500 years of the current era, before the current era. But Indian history writing, as I was saying yesterday, is about 100 years old. You know, the first uh, so-called uh, acceptably modern histories of uh, coming out of India by written by Indians are about 100. but the other tradition is is 3500 years old so how can you ignore a 35 hundred as some of our uh, modern historians have tried to do by negating it completely in the in the same way that mill and macaulay tried to negate it by saying this is not a source of knowledge it if it is a source of knowledge it it signifies or embodies the unripe cognition of the people who have lately come into rationality so you can dif- divide the world into people with history and people without history and the colonized world is composed of or consists of people without history and often times the lone exception suppose at least kalhana but the point of trying to make is what kalhana has in common with the itihasa purana tradition as also with the bardic tradition of which 
Professor Madhav Hada is an expert. He's actually, you know, working on the different, uh, you know, versions of the Padmavati story. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But what all these versions have in common is that dimension of the Panchamaveda, the edification dimension, the moral or ethical dimension of the Purusharthas. And here the criterion is Lok Kalyan or Jana. Uh, or or uh, praja, sorry, not janam, but praja uh, anupalana, praja anupalana. I'm quoting from her book, uh, and uh, and so I think this is a very important contribution of hers, and and uh, and uh, in Kalhana, uh, I mean she has said it. I'm not saying it. Uh, he he criticizes everyone except. Those who are pure-minded, you know, he does have a have a group of people he considers the truly sajjan, the suddhadi, you know, the sat and the the satman man manasvi people, people who are uh, so these he thinks are in some ways, uh, you know, like the uh, famous quotation of from the Mahabharata of the Mahajan. These he considers to be people who keep society going because uh, I think when we read Kalhana, we see that the Kashmiris are the most quarrelsome people. There's always a revolt, there's always intrigue going on. And uh, in some sense, people have argued, and, and uh, Shonalika ji, you can correct me, that the rasa, if you go back to the rasa aesthetics of India, the rasa of Kalhana is Shanta rasa. Because he writes from a kind of detached uh, aloofness about the events of his own also, land, he's... which he loves dearly, dearly. The, the Vitasta River, the Jhelum, etc. He loves the land and its people dearly. But he has that aloofness that comes from Shanta Rasa, which was around the same time codified and described by Anand Pardhana and Abhinav Gupta. And one question I have for you right at the beginning is that uh, I don't believe that Kalhana mentions these great people. I wonder why. Do he mention some other people, the founders of, uh, uh, you know, Kashmir Trakadarshan? He doesn't mention, I think, the greatest intellectual of the time, Abhinav Gupt. I don't know why he doesn't, but that's a question for you. But I want to welcome you one, once more, but just to say one more little thing and then hand it to you, which is that uh, when we think about uh, a broader category, of understanding our past, we may call it history for lack of better word. We already see that there is the modern historiography, which is about a hundred years old. There is the very old narrative tradition of India, which goes back at least to the Rig Veda. And in addition, there is folk memories, Hala Puranas, and Upa Puranas, and the major Puranas, 18 of them, the Maha Puranas. So there's a wealth of material. And each of these kinds of texts has lists, genealogies. I mean, the genealogies of the solar and the lunar dynasties, Ikshavaku dynasty or whatever, you know, and uh, the Yaduvangsha. All of these texts have genealogy. The Bharata's Natya Shastra has genealogy. <clears throat> now, you might call these mythical, but certainly they allude to or they gesture towards some kind of importance to explain. Sufi, Khanda, or Darga will have, uh, which is, uh, can you hear me? Uh, are we facing yes. some interruptions? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes to both. There okay, are interruptions. So, uh, thank you. So I'm saying there are some elements in these uh, narratives which seem to correspond uh, to some extent, to what we consider uh, valid documents as per modern historiography. That's one. And of course, there are inscriptions. Every temple has an inscription of the donors, some verses in praise of uh, those who helped to build it. Great temples of India. I mean, there are some old old buildings like the Sanchi Stupa. There's a stupa in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, Professor Wink, I'm sure you know. 
which is very tall, which is over 100 meters tall, 122 meters, second century, I'm told. And the only tallest, only building taller than that was the pyramids, 137, 140 meters, I'm told. So talking about buildings, we'll come back to Professor Wink later. But just throwing this out because I'm saying every major building in the ancient world or even the medieval world has a record of the donors, land grants uh, to temples and so forth. So there are there is another set of records now. Finally, there's folk memory, there's cultural memory, and there's bardic compositions, which is why I brought in Professor Hada. He's collected as many as seven major or maybe more major oral uh, recitations and narratives of just Padmavati. And Padmavati, we don't know if he's a historical figure. If you look far and wide, you don't know where is the proof. Padmavat was written by Jaisi much later, 500 years later. Jaisi was in Uttar Pradesh near Jaunpur, and the scene of the action is in Chittorgad. But do we completely, uh, uh, you know, dismiss these accounts? This is a question for Shonalika ji, who's giving the uh, valedictory talk. Do we discuss, uh, do, sorry, do, do we dismiss Prithviraj Raso? Do we dismiss these bardic? accounts and finally uh, when we once again look at the popular reconstruction like you see anarkali so many movies made on anarkali there's even a tomb in lahore but no historical record so is this can we do a functionalist reading of such characters that they signify the softer side of what was probably a very cruel time medieval times were cruel even in europe i went to denmark where they have a history Free, uh, sorry, Museum of Torture. Many places don't, but then has one. And similarly, there are museums of slavery in Brazil. Not in the US, I haven't seen them. It was a very cruel time. So was there a functional reason for inventing these stories? We don't know. But not only Anarkali and Salim, but Jodha Akbar and, and, and Padmav, Padmavati of Elila Bhansali. These are recurrent figures in the popular imagination. I was hoping that Uday Kulkarni ji could join us in Marathi Dada, hundreds of novels on Shivaji. You know, there's some very famous ones, but there's so many novels. Swami is one of them, very famous novel, recreations of that period. Constantly people are writing about these characters, right? So there must be some value to this or some, some politics. After all, Ranjit Guha do. There are no records of peasant revolts or tribal insurrections. You have to excavate colonial records. And if you say collector so and so went to such and such a place and pacified uh, the bheels or whatever, you've got to read it in a different way. So I'm only wondering, I'm asking, since you've done this great work on Raja Tarangini, is there a way that uh, read uh, these? material, the hermeneutics that we need uh, to access these narratives, not calling them history in the modern sense, not at all. We shouldn't make these mistakes because, and this is my final point, one of the books which is again very controversial is a book called The Nay Science by Adluri, Vishwa Adluri and Joydeep Bhakti. Now, you may like it, you may not like it, but one of the arguments of the book is that to apply the historical critical method to understand Indian text uh, does violence to these texts. That is their argument. Because I think, as I understand it, I mean, there's a million ways of that. You know, the day science, of course, uh, if you're missing, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. The day science, of course, alludes to Nietzsche. And Nietzsche wrote a book called The Gay Science. I think, and use the word gay not in the sense we use it today. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah, so gay science was your gay science. Of course, Nietzsche was gay in our modern sense, but he used the word gay science in a different way, I think. But the point is that Nietzsche was challenging a certain way in which Europe was doing history you know, the primacy given to rationality, the way they dated things, the way they 
classified the rest of the world. Hegel does it. So the, the point is that today a lot of people in India are trying to date the Mahabharat. You know, they're using uh, <clears throat> the position of stars. Still up did it long ago, but now they're doing, they have more sophisticated means to do it. Uh, they try to date the Mahabharat, they try to date the Ramayana, they try to date the so-called Puranic, Itihasa Puranas, all with the view, I think, to glorify ancient India. Okay, that's fine. Everybody has a right to what they wish to do. But if you read what Adluri and uh, Bhakti are trying to say, is that this would be a great error. I mean, it would be a tactical error. Forget about being you know, an error in terms of methodology, difficult to date these things. Uh, and there are many of them are amateurs, so to speak. They're not historians, which is Makaranji, another issue. Makaranji, yeah. uh, everything you're saying is so is so provocative and tantalizing that I can't resist responding any further. So I, I do want to come in and say, uh, on this last point, I think there has to be a via media. So I understand why some of these texts and traditions uh, people would want to date them because of a certain obsession with chronology itself and with questions of precedence and which came first, whether it is Indic traditions or their European counterparts and so on. So there is all that kind of global politics that really underlies some of this um, uh, chronological competitiveness. It can be understood in its, in its own sense. Uh, but what I will argue today, for example, is that this is only one part of a larger disciplinary fetishism that the discipline exactly. of the come to represent. Exactly. That is all I'm saying. So I'm saying all these issues put together, we are going to lay at your doorstep, if not at your feet, then you can problematize them any way you want to. Uh, and that's all I'm saying, that we are being inserted yes. into history, we are getting competitive, and then there are, uh, and I'm saying maybe, Maybe uh, that is not the way to understand our civilization, certainly not the only way. And, uh, and I think that the multimodal, the multi-dimensional, uh, and the multi-generic, uh, et cetera, may be uh, a more useful way. And therefore, history, para-history, non-history, et cetera, should all be grist to our historical mill. So with these words, I welcome you. Yeah, you have the floor, and I'm sorry that we are late once again, but uh, 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 unless Lavanya ji wants to add her words of welcome. Uh, go ahead, Lavanya ji, one, uh, please say her, your own word of welcome, and it's over to you, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Makran ji. Um, uh, Professor Sonalika ji, uh, we welcome you uh, to deliver your uh, valedictory lecture. Um, we're looking forward. Professor Sunalka Ji, as uh, all of you know, uh, is an um, uh, associate professor at uh, Center for Historical Studies at JNU. Uh, and we are uh, happy to have you as our valedictory uh, speaker. Sunalka Ji, please. Can I be heard clearly? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much, Makaranji, Lavanyaji, for this warm invitation. Uh, Namaskar, it is a great pleasure to be delivering the valedictory address at this international symposium. A symposium that has attempted in diverse ways since yesterday to re-examine some of the trajectories that Indian historiography has taken since independence. In the spirit of things, therefore, what I will briefly attempt today is to speak of some challenges and opportunities that such an exercise entails, weaving the discussion around two wider conceptual questions, which, as we will see, relate in fundamental ways to both theory and praxis of history as an academic discipline. So I hope to do something of an expository uh, talk today. Such a discussion will also perhaps address and bring together certain concerns that have been raised by other speakers yesterday and today, and you will recognize these in my talk. So what are these two larger fundamental questions that I think we should think about? The first is, what is history? For 200 years now, Indologists have not asked this 
But another related question that did we write history? Were ancient Indians and Sanskrit traditions in particular even capable of writing history in the midst of the abundance of spiritual, mythological and aesthetic literature they produced instead? That's what we were told, that this became the central existential question about the Indian civilization as it were. It would be fair to say that this question has been, perhaps naturally, one to dominate Indian historiography, resulting, however, only in various, what I think are defensive and epistemically ambivalent attempts to say that what we wrote was, for example, an embedded history, but not an overt one. So we have our back against the wall, as it were, when the question of history comes up and we say, we want to claim we wrote history, and yet we must add these qualifiers that no, it was embedded, or it was of a different kind, it was a consciousness, but it was not actual practice, it wasn't a uh, independent genre and so on. What there has been no cause for reconsidering is this understanding of history itself that we are trying to fit ourselves into. A 19th century post enlightenment positivist understanding of history in which not only were such ancient genres as the mythological and the aesthetic not historical, regardless of their cherished centrality to a continuous living civilization like India, but in this understanding, Rankian criteria, Rankian, as you all know, is from Leopold von Ranke, who was this uh, philosopher of history who came to be very, very influential in defining this discipline. So Rankian criteria such as facticity, empiricism, rationality, scientific method, objectivity, these came to be deemed the only acceptable criteria of history. This inaugurated what Ethan Kleinberg rightly calls a disciplinary essentialism and a methodological fetish at the heart of history. So it is important for us as practitioners of this discipline to first recognize this, to know the origins of the discipline and also how it proceeded to establish this certain very narrow and hidebound, I would say, definition of what it is all about. What's more, this disciplinary essentialism emerged as enlightened modernity in Europe, but was transferred and experienced as colonial modernity in India and the rest of the world. Both modernism and colonialism thrived on a rejection of and a break with the pre-modern past of ancient indigenous societies and the values and priorities that these may have privileged. Born of this intellectual political moment, history thus may be said to have originated as a handy tool for the construction of cultural difference in the hands of empire. So history, in a way, as Makarandi was saying a little while ago, becomes this parameter by which you can divide the world and segregate those who are told that they never wrote history and just couldn't write it either. So history becomes a handy tool for the construction of cultural difference in the hands of empire, a tool that has long outlived empire itself in how it continues to exercise a hegemonic, and exclusionary ambit the world over. The fact that it is exclusionary, I think, is of the essence, and I will talk more about this. Thus, it is against such parameters, the deep empiricism that underlies the global indigent definition of history, that scholars took to evaluating Indian texts and passing or failing them on the test of history, as it were. This began with the Orientalist and Imperialist historians, all right, but was very much continued by mainstream Indian scholars since independence in what can only be described as perhaps a scramble for coevality with Western intellectual standards. Correspondingly, traditional Indian strategies of representation, such as myth, rhetoric, and didactics, were always found wanting, and they were shunned inferiorized and othered in a classic display of the coming together of, on the one hand, modernism's overweening anxiety for certitudes, 
mensurability and empirical rationality rather than for the ethical value based. And on the other hand, imperialism's objective of undermining and delegitimizing indigenous modes of knowledge production and transmission. One need only recall James Mill's scathing diatribe against Indian literary traditions for not measuring up to Judeo-Christian ones. And Professor Wink was talking about something similar, that the comparison is always an external standard rather than exploring the Indic civilization on its own terms. And why in India, among historians, the rhetoric is of radicalism, the reality seems to be of being in a continuing thrall Western definition of history that has since been rendered as a global one. Mind you, as Norbert Elias once put it, the West, when I say the West, it does not indicate a cardinal direction so much as a mindset, so that it could and it did have votaries anywhere in the world, including in our country. A case in point is what they did to Kalhan's Raj Tarangini. This 12th century narrative of the world studies of Kashmir over two millennia is a Mahakavya or Prabandha. That is classic epic poetry in Sanskrit. It is better known, however, as history rather than poetry. In fact, the first and only work of history proper in all of Sanskrit literature, we are told, ever since it was partially translated into English in 1825 by the Orientalist Harold Wilson. This founding characterization of the text was confirmed by George Bueller later and his pupil, Oral Stein, who produced the Raj Tarangani's first critical edition and complete English translation in 1900. And what were these people so excited about vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Raj Tarangani? Basically, what they perceived to be its very historical qualities, namely, its overt reference to chronology, assigning dates in different eras for the ascension and end of every vision, its alleged quest for objectivity, mirrored in the poet's call to impartiality, and its display of causation, attributing events to explanations. Now, I have critiqued all of these points in the book. I won't go into that here. But what needs to be noted is that these were features that made this text, to their mind, stand out in a literary culture otherwise infamous for its alleged poverty of historical sense. So celebration of this one text was in fact based on the deprecation of an entire literary culture and civilization from which the Raj Tarangani was sought to be artificially segregated and disembedded as some sole exception. I have shown in the book that she is far from an exception she is actually a deeply intertextual Indic text that brings together not only Itihas and Quran, but also Kavya, Shastra, Niti, Vanshavan. All of these are actually being brought together by this text, and perhaps there is where its iconicity may lie, rather than in being separate from or distant or departing from Sanskrit traditions. But that is not how it was perceived. That is not how it was discovered and celebrated by the Anglophonic uh, historiographical world. The if all reasons why it is so necessary to contest this empiricist reading of the Raj Tarangani as history and to contest the very project of history that underlaid it. But contested it was not. Indeed, much later in the 1960s, Indologists like E.L. Basham and R.C. Majumdar were saying the same things in praise of the text that their forebears had been saying. See, for example, this representative statement. <coughs> Quote, even a modern historian should have little hesitation in ranking Kalhan as a great historian for his correct appreciation of the true ideals and methods of history. Unquote. This is R.C. Majumdar true ideals and methods of history. And this is what became canonical. 
This is exactly how Kalan continues to be taught in classrooms in India till today. There was just one problem in this glowing appraisal of the Raj Tarangini. All these scholars found themselves stumped by other aspects of the text that did not fit their idea of what history should be. Aspects which they then had to disown and described as, quote, failings and imperfections. So suddenly the same uh, Sanskrit scholar who is the ideal modern historian develops these failings and imperfections. Thus, Stein thought that the rhetoric and didactic parts of the Raj Tarangani that were in Kavya style were simply unconnected with the narrative proper, which was historical. He actually also edited out some of these parts, saying, oh, these are too Kavya-like. The fact that the entire text is a Mahakavya, so that those um, the pure poetic descriptions or passages are not redundant to the text did not cross his mind. Because the idea that this is a work of history and that is all that should be projected in the text led him to actually edit out and bracket out parts that he thought just didn't fit in. Um, while Bueller indicted the resort to legend and myth in the Raj Tarangani as rendering the chronology of large part of the text valueless, quote unquote. So chronology is a great thing in the Raj Tarangani, but chronology is a valueless in the Raj Tarangani. You see the contradictions in this, within this understanding of the Raj Tarangani as history itself. He also thought that the author was very suspect, Kalhan was very suspect for uh, drawing on legend and myth suddenly in the middle of what they were otherwise thinking is this very proper historical narration. Following suit, despite christening Kalhan a great historian, Majumdar spoke of his, quote, very defective method. I'm quoting from within the same piece written by Majumdar on Kalhan. And what did this very defective method consist in? What were Kalhan's cardinal sins? Inclusion of mythical or legendary kings? A blind faith in the epics and Purans? So drawing on what were perceived to be the traditional repository of knowledge in the Indic Ecumen suddenly became a sin. A belief in witchcraft and magic? Explanation of events as due to the influence of fate rather than to any rational cause, I'm quoting throughout. A didactic tendency, so even this is a problem. A didactic tendency inspired by Hindu views of karma. And finally, mere display of poetic and rhetorical skill, mere display. So poetics and rhetoric rendered as is essentially sterile constructs essentially just meant for indulgence and pleasure rather than being meaningful symbolic constructs. And I have argued in my other books that that is exactly how aesthetics need to be read. They were actually meaningful constructs that are trying to render certain representations of a variety of historical phenomena, whether it's urbanism or regional history and so on. Based on this vantage, both Majumdar and Basham maintained that the first three tarangas, the first three books of the Raj Tarangani, it, it consists of eight books, were less credible than the last five. So did Romila Thapar in the 1980s, who taught us to distinguish between what she called earlier books, where supernatural causes and fate were important, and later books that reflected, we were told, quote, the maturity of Kalhan's historical thinking. So suddenly the same author comes into his own within one single text. This is a separation between the earlier books and the latter ones that continues to inform modern readings of the text. Harper also dismissed Kalhan's moralism and didacticism as some kind of Brahminical vestige. Philologists and historians who dominated the study of the Raj Tarn thus ended up fragmenting it, splintering it, setting up some parts of it against other parts, as it were, obfuscating rather than elucidating the nature of the text as a whole and not seeing it on its own terms. Moreover, all aspects of figuration proper to a poetic discourse 
were deemed extraneous and detrimental to the essentially historical substance and intent of Cullen's enterprise. And this historical intent was presumed antithetical to the poetic. And this is the methodological issue I want to draw your attention to. This binary that has come to pervade the discipline of history, that the literary and the poetic, especially when these are ancient uh, works of writing, that these stand in a binary opposition to history. They cannot be history. Whereas I submit to you that this is entirely inspired from modern post-enlightenment, as I said, objectivist notions of history in the West, rather than from any indigenous or ancient approaches to treating of the past. Because this underlying belief, this fundamental belief, a kind of core tenet of history, this belief in the opposition of factual or true history and fictive or false literature, this was new even to 19th century Europe. It was the creation of this moment because it, it belies the practice even in classical antiquity, in ancient Greece and Rome where history was considered but a form of fine literature with no prejudice to its truth value. So if you wrote ornate and beautiful literature, that does not compromise the truth value of a text. This is something that modern discipline of history was reluctant to accept, especially about ancient works. And I will say something more about this alternative historical vision that, according to me, can be founded on poetics in just a moment. But as things stood with the Raj what we find is that positivism, to, to speak sweepingly, positivism mingled with imperialism end up downgrading and delegitimizing indigenous narratives of the past. In being isolated as a flawed exception in all of Sanskrit literature, the Raj Tarangani as objectivist history was both the creation and victim of an intellectual approach that sought to simultaneously appropriate and undermine a traditional Sanskrit text. So it is both celebrated, but is also essentially being victimized. It is being both appropriated and being judged, evaluated, and undermined. And what is Additionally interesting is that this was subscribed to by scholars across the ideological board, from Orientalist to Nationalist, Marxist, and other materialist historians, attesting thereby perhaps both the lure and the hold of positivism in Indian academia. So this is something that I'm flagging. Now, I have critiqued at length the major errors of category executed by this modern reinvention of the Raj Tarangani. With regard to chronology, the Raj Tarangani is certainly not the first, nor is she unique in giving these chronological, um, a chronological order to her narration. Um, myth and causality, I have shown how these were also legitimate modes of historical representation within this text. Objectivity. Poor E.H. Kar, it's been, what, 70 years now since he uh, cried himself hoarse that objectivity is a preposterous fallacy. I'm quoting him. A preposterous fallacy uh, in history. That is just not possible. And yet, yet, perhaps because it continues to be this modernist aspiration of historians, so we also continue to look for it in texts to say, yes, this ancient text was history or no, it was not. So I have, I have actually critiqued each of these in, in the book. Uh, and, and what this did was this, this divesting of the Raj Tarangani of all poetic features and recurrent tendencies like rhetoric, like didactics, that were true to the traditional Sanskrit that she was. So I have critiqued all of this there. Because this spawned an understanding of the text that was in fact divorced from its own literary culture and logic. So it was a fundamental act of disembedding a text from its literary culture. And after that, all hell breaks loose because no wonder that they misread it so completely and then got caught up in their own misreading of it because we saw that this understanding of Raj Tarangani's history 
turned out to be collapsible under its own contradictions. So they were giving compliments to you know, the right hand and having to take them back with the left. I don't have time to go further into uh, this critique today, but perhaps I have said enough already to highlight how the mainstream understanding of history in India seems to be predicated on positivist valorizations and a concomitant rejection of traditional Indian modes of historical engagement. This is why I propose that we have been asking the wrong question, that did we write history? The question really needs to be asked is, what is history? And this needs to be informed by an aspiration for a truly global, decolonized knowledge order, which embraces answers from the global south. In this case, from the Indic Ecumen, which may actually offer alternative more holistic historical visions which serve functions and prioritize values possibly far removed from what Euro-American modernity may allow. It's high time that such visions of history are also taken on board. And this is not a call, I have to say this, this is not a call out of some kind of nativism or jingoism or chauvinism but an acknowledgement of the plurality that in fact inheres in global ideas of history across the world. An epic diversity that has been papered over by what we have today, which is a hegemonic intellectual world order. It would be incomplete after having said this, because we can all talk about decolonization, but what really counts is demonstrating how this may be possible. So it would be incomplete to not go into what this alternative Indic vision and strategies of history may have consisted in. So let me say something briefly about this. I study Sanskrit poetry and drama, which is also Kavya, and I argue that at striking variance with modern historians, the ancients conceived of Kavya as an ideal historical mode calling it Deepam Bhut Vastu Prakashikam, the lamp that illumines past matters or past realities. And why not? Because continuing a Vedic tradition explicated in the 5th century BCE Nirukta, across 1500 years thereafter, Kavya theory or Alankara, within this Kavya theory, they obtained an enormous cultural investment in the poet or the kavi as the kranta drishta, the kranta drishta, the true seer, and his privileged epistemic insight and authority that extended to matters past. So here we have this figure of epistemic authority, and that is the poet or the kavi. Thus, Kalhan, in a metapoetic and self reflexive vein, echoes many of the Sanskrit rhetorician and poet before him, like Barna, Kumtakar, Anand Vardhana, and Abhinav, when he speaks of the Kavi being able to gauge the true nature of all things, Sarva Samved, Dhyan Bhavan, something that others can't see, poets can actually see. And by, by see here, see is symbolic. Uh, darshana, Drishti Darshana. So Darshana means philosophy, but why? because it consists in being able to truly see through reality and see the true nature of reality. So the Kavi is actually partaking of this cultural understanding, uh, which, uh, which typically is associated with spiritual figures like yogins. In fact, some works of uh, Sanskrit poetics explicitly compare the Kavi with the Rishi and says that the only difference is they both have Darshana or Drishti. The only difference is Kavi also has Varnana powers of description. And that's putting it so pithily, actually, because that's exactly what's going on. So uh, Kalhan spoke of the Kavi being able to gauge the true nature of all things by virtue of his poetic intuition, Pratibhaya. As he puts it, quote, who else is capable of making visible Pratyakshata, bygone times, except the poet creator, Kavi Prajapati? or Kavi Devhas, who produces delightful productions 
Ramya Nirmar. Unquote. So here is a clear statement of the quintessentially historical function of rendering the past. And that too in a recognizably constructivist understanding of history, which renders it as a production, nirmana. So Sanskrit poetry is recognizing that history is the production or work of the poet historian and is not an empirical given. It is not some foreclosed empirical given. Moreover, I also argue that for the Sanskrit poet, writing history did not exhaust truth. Ethicizing reality by narrativizing it was more the goal. This definition of history that we modern historians have entirely missed and failed to reclaim, busy as we have been chasing a culturally inappropriate and narrow view of history, this endogenous definition of history invested the cultural function. Cultural function seems to have been very clearly theorized and articulated in early India. Why do I say this? Witness this explicit and self-assured, very self-assured definition, no, no internal contradictions. This definition widely quoted by the Indian epics and the Puranas. What do they say? What does this mean? Narrations of the past, Pura Vrittam, that are in story form, Katha Yuktam, so the narrative, and equipped with Upadesha, instruction. In what? Dharmartha Kama Moksharna. So piety, power, pleasure, and liberation. That is called Itihasa or history. So Dharmartha Kama Moksharna, Upadesha Samanvita. So Upadesha, the didactic function of history is clearly stated. The form that history ought to take is also given that it's a narrative form about the past. And that what does it instruct in? It instructs in the four ends of man, the four ends of humanity, as it was understood by them. So here is a very clear historical vision, which is an alternative to this modern empiricist one. And yet it has hardly been entertained. It has had to actually struggle to find recognition in terms of oh, the Ishihas Quran tradition or, you know, bracketed out. The Indic vision of history has forever been bracketed as this exotic niche understanding of history go by. I say that it's time that the envelope be pushed on the discipline of history itself. That such alternative understandings of history, whether it's from India or other parts of the global south, actually now be, let them inflect the modern discipline of history, let them break through the disciplinary essentialism that, that I talked about earlier. Indeed, Kavya's own stated objectives, right from Bharata, his Naki Shastra, through Bhama, Hoja, down to Labinavu. According to them, Kavya's objectives went well beyond aesthetic. So this is another problem with um, uh, historiography of, of India, that this entire realm of poetic and aesthetic literature was simply denied as historical because they said this is about aesthetics only. And aesthetics in turn are only about pleasure and entertainment, and they are not about historical representation at all. And I, you know, right from my first book, which was in cities in Sanskrit Kavyas and, and came out 12 years ago, through all of my works, have been actually showing how aesthetics were meaningful semantic codes, that they actually are conveying a meaning and not just the form, the ornate form of, of culture. So I have, I have shown and argued for long that um, Sanskrit Kavya's own theory says that Kavya's objectives went beyond the aesthetic to, to the deeply mimetic and didactic. And the words that are used, the expressions that are used in this, uh, rhetoricians I named, are lokasya anukarana, imitation of the world, as mimetic as it gets and Upadesha or Adhyam. And let me quote Abhinav Gupta to seal the deal. 
when he says, quote, the end result of the savoring of rasa, rasa is aesthetic flavor. So the end result of the savoring of rasa is instruction in dharma and the other end of humanity, unquote. So what I'm saying is that at the heart of Sanskrit aesthetics was an insistent theory of socio-ethical pedagogy. And this should not surprise us at all, given the deeply intertextual, semantic and conceptual universe that Sanskrit was inhabiting. So that different Sanskrit genres actually were speaking to each other and informing each other whether it was Kavya or Shastra or Niti or Vanshavali or Purana, they are all actually bouncing off each other. What to my mind seems to be my, my sense is that there is this larger cultural understanding of what constitutes the true nature of knowledge and the true nature of reality ultimately. And the different cultural forms such as poetry on the one hand or dance and sculpture and aesthetics or, or even some branches of science and mathematics are all about ultimately striving towards that cultural ideal or that cultural aim, which typically ends up being more or liberation. Let's come back to Gavya. This didacticism that I'm talking about, this pedagogy, why is it relevant to the question of history? Because it framed not only the rhetorical, but the historical agenda of Sanskrit poetry where time was conceived as a laboratory for overarching ethical principles governing social behavior to play out. In fact, the coalescing of didactic with historical functions via poetry meant that the model of epistemic truth generated by Kavya was both transcendent in invoking higher ethical ends so history and ethics are coming together. And thus it is that Kalham's documentation of umpteen figures and events from Kashmir's history is also, as I have shown in my book, crucially organized around certain ethical principles that constituted, according to him, true knowledge of time and human action. Thus the centrality of dharma and karma to the Rajdharanda. And I like to define dharma and karma not in the typical ways that these are debated to be, but I like to define these as a certain critical idealism and a call to action. Because that is to find how Kalhan actually replays dharma and karma. He is constantly invoking a critical idealism. And he demands this not only of the kings he talks about, but he demands this high standard of ethical behavior of every character, of every class and background that he talks about. So I, I personally think there is a very deep humanity that shines through Kalhan's work and which has been completely missed by, by historians. In fact, they call it his cynicism. They think he's being cynical when he's attacking this king or that for being a debauch or whatever it is. I don't think it's cynicism at all. I think it's, it's a very deep-rooted concern for orthopraxis, for right conduct, rather than for orthodoxy. So I was saying that hence we have the centrality of dharma and karma in the Raj Tarangani, but more so the centrality of the ultimate ethic. And what is the ultimate ethic? It is detachment, detachment from worldly pursuits and power in an ever-changing, fluctuating, asthai is the word he uses, and therefore illusory world. So an ever-changing and fluctuating world is also an illusory world. And we know this from all the very many hegemonic works from Vedanta and, and on Advait and uh, uh, Buddhism itself which talks about the, which is so deeply nihilistic, which talks about how nothing exists for more than a moment, the momentariness, the, uh, the shunyata, essential shunyata of reality and the momentariness of everything else. So you can see again the intertextuality that is speaking through 
Kalhan that's shining through Kalhan and informing his historical vision, actually providing a denouement to his historical vision. So what does he say? Quote, and this is just one example I'm giving you. He, there are very many in the text and they're all in the book. But he says, even after realizing the transient nature of existence, Gyatva api asthayim sthitim, fools do not give up ambition. Murhaha prarudim mudchanti, seduced as they are by the attractions of treacherous fortune. Droha shri lodha mohita. But on the same path of death is every individual plunging headlong. I am the slayer and he the slain. The notion of a difference between the two lasts but a short while. He who but yesterday exults while slaying his foe, at the end sees an enemy gloating over him when he is himself about to be killed. How awful. Fie on this illusion. Thick aho I am andhyava. Unquote. Here is a profound deposition on temporality itself. In fact, he prescribes the Raj Tarangini in his Prayojana, which is the beginning of the text, as an antidote. The word he uses is Bheshadja, which is a medicine or a remedy, as an antidote for Ullase Rase Va Desha Kalayo. That is, times of expansion and contraction, of ascent and decline in human fortunes. So what we are getting is history as not just documentation of, but also panacea for the inherent instability of life. So here is the deep cultural function and value assigned to history, which goes far beyond the simple mere act of putting together a large number of facts. So we have one, a recognition of that fundamentally historical quality of time change, you see? So historical change or diachronicity is something that modern historians love to talk about, but here's this man in the 12th century who is already pointing it out. And he's doing it not from some uh, disciplinary point of view, but because the larger cultural understanding of time is this that it is replete with change and, and instability. So you're getting one, a recognition of this historical character of time in, in Kalhan, and two, the overlaying on that understanding of time of the archetypical Indic sociological solution, namely adopting equanimity, samatva, and detachment, vairagya which are represented in literary theory as the shanta rasa, or the aesthetic of equipoise and pisans. So Kalan states this right in the beginning of his text that he has composed this work in the shanta rasa, his choice out of nine rasas. It's a different matter, all the rasas show up in the text during his narration, but he, he's giving you the sign from this hint that this is the larger purpose of this text and therefore of his endeavor to pen this history of Kashmir. So as represented by the emblematic Raj Tarangani, the Indic historical vision consisted in the coming together, in the coming together. So it's not an opposition or choice. It's a coming together of empirical and ethical functions, which poetry was culturally mandated to deliver providing a discursive and commentarial effect to history and a transcendental value over and above a merely documentarial one. So that is all about the first question I wanted to put to you, which is what is history? And can we come up with endogenous understandings of history that in a way address and heal and reconcile many of the internal contradictions and deep epistemic problems in the modern understanding of history, which, which makes this modern understanding of history so ill at ease, such, such difficult bedfellows with Indic traditions. The answer is not to be defensive about the Indic traditions, but to in fact interrogate the origins and the lineages of the 
modern global understanding of history itself. Um, I will be quick with the second half because I um, have just about a certain amount of time to speak. The second conceptual question I want to raise today after what is history is what is India? When we speak of Indian history in this symposium or when we offer courses on it in our universities, <clears throat> what are we talking about without first clarity on the question, what is India in the first place? Now, obviously, I don't need to ask about the India that came into being in 1947. I ask about the India that preceded not 1947 by five millennia. What is that India? And why have we in mainstream academia, but for a few exceptions, like Radha Kumud Mukherjee long back and B.D. Chattopadhyay more recently, why have the rest of mainstream academia shown such reticence in engaging with this fundamental question that what is India before the British came? As if there was something inherently reactionary or chauvinistic about exploring this question. Why does India have to bear the burden of these associations with asking the question that what is the pre-modern history of India? What is the pre-modern idea of India? Why does it automatically become something that is to be averted and avoided and shunned? Uh, that's something to think about. I think you will agree that academic reactions to such a question today that what is India typically range from either taking India as an unexamined given category or denying its very existence before the British colonized us. Now, latter denying the existence of an idea of India before the British is perhaps a more serious historiography. Because as we will see, it chooses to ignore or silence rather too vast a body of evidence that does attest the existence of a clear pre-modern idea of India. And I'll talk about this. But when there is so much evidence, why then is there this denial of an idea of India in uh, pre-colonial times? Now, one reason is again, this modern myopia and hubris that preempts looking back beyond the colonial disjuncture. Because the experience of colonialism is seen to be defining of everything that India is today. And this is as great an irony as they can be, surely, for such a continuous living civilization as we are. Is India really nothing but the product of uh, the colonial disjuncture? Significant though it was, and overwhelmingly transformative though that colonial disjuncture was, but is that all India really is? A second reason for this reticence or denial of, of, of pre-modern India is clearly a direct hangover of colonial politics and historiography, whether we are thinking Mill or um, Macaulay or Sir John Strachey, who used, who, who used to teach the Indian civil services, the Indian imperial services at that time and tell them in so many words that there never was and never, there, there is not anything called India. So, it is a hangover of colonial politics which prided itself in this instrumentalist disinformation that there never was an India. But the third reason, and the reason that is actually proffered by modern Indian historians today, if you put this question to them, people who deny the existence of an India before the British somehow hammered us into shape, the reason they give you is that, listen, India has always been too vast and too diverse to ever be one unified entity. That it was what one scholar has called an unnatural nation. And it is only modern developments such as British rule first and the freedom movement that forced a diverse and disconnected bunch of regions and peoples into one artificial and unhistorical entity called the Indian nation. This is what we are told. In other words, a country as sprawling and heterogeneous as India could never have been considered one. And all attempts since 1947 to forge a unified nation have been nothing more than a 
precarious statist project rather than the culmination of a long and rich past. I think the political ideological undertones to such a position are self-evident and they don't need laboring. But let this be the opportunity for a display of some epistemic courage. Because the irrefutable fact is that despite the enduring colonial legacy, there are astonishing convergences over two millennia in the way that a disparate set of historical commentators and observers attest a readily recognizable idea of India. And further, most remarkably, this idea that we see across two millennia from such disparate uh, voices is seen to embrace with no apparent sense of unease both India's spatial, spatial unity, despite her vastness, as well as her incredible diversity. Now, now, this will sound familiar to most of you who are conversant with the claims of India's nationalist movement leading up to 1947, the whole slogan of unity and diversity. But what I want to draw your attention to is that it is not the invention of that movement. You actually get statements to this effect from 2000 years before the nationalist movement. And let me put them for you. We have pre-modern Indian texts that put out this inclusive vision of what India is ages ago. And it is time we acknowledge and explore this remarkable phenomenon instead of villainizing any attempt to go into this. Let me just summarize this. So I've written extensively and spoken about it before, but just some markers for those of you who may not be familiar with the lay of the land. Perhaps the earliest text to define India, Bharat Varsha, broadly yet resonantly as the land between the Himalayas and the sea is the Hori Bharat. I'm not going into the issue of dates, but we know that it is well into the BCE. In particular, I draw your attention to the Bhishma Parva's Navamadhyaya, which details in over 70 verses. First, it's a very self-conscious discussion. So you see, they are not shy of asking this question right in the beginning, that what is India? What is Bharat Varsha? But we have developed this tremendous reticence about engaging in this question. So the Mahabharata gives 70 verses to asking what is this Bharat Varsha? And uh, it details first the geography, and then the ethnography of Bharat Varsha, which means the Janapadas, that is the communities and the peoples that inhabited Bharat Varsha, are given in such mind-boggling detail that it actually led a scholar to say that the Mahabharata is really the first anthropology project, uh, perhaps anywhere in the world, the kinds of details that are given. Now, incredibly, these Janas, these communities that the Mahabharata is enumerating, included everyone you can think of from the people of Kashmir, Gandhar, Cambodia, and Punjab, to Vidarbha and Malava, and from Kashi, Magad, Odisha, Bengal, Assam, to Dravida, Kerala, Karnataka, Kuntala, which is Telangana, and the Chola. It's naming you these two and a half thousand years ago. And it's also naming it's including in its list of Janas who constitute Bharat Varsha, Mlechas and Yavanas on the one hand. That is, the Greeks and the outsiders, so to speak. And on the other hand, tribes such as the Nishadas, Shabaras, Kiratas and Abhiras. There is also an explicit reference to all the four castes inhabiting Bharat Varsha. So they're all named as belonging to this country. In this great Indian epic's testimony, no conflict is seen between the spatial unity and identity of India and its inherent diversity and plurality. Instead, there is a free and frank acknowledgement of India's geographic and ethnic complexity and reality. This is seen rather than any exclusionary vision of India that this is the land of only these people or that. No such thing. Again, in the Vishnu Puran, which comes later than the Mahabharata, we have the following saying, Uttaram yat samudrasya himadreshya dakshinam varsham tad bharatam nama bharati yatra santitihi. 
ईस्ट and yavanas in the west so it's giving you the boundaries of this place now who are the kiratas they refer to denizens of assam and the eastern himalayas while yavanas refer to those who settled in greater punjab so can there be a more explicit and inclusive self understanding of india and in this understanding further what is the preeminent characteristic of this land not that it is the land of this faith or that community but that it is the only land of karma karma bhumir yam on the entire planet what a mind boggling definition of the country and how how modern we really. meaning it is the land of action by which people can ascend to heaven or hell or moksha that is make their own destinies now this explicitness in what india is and this inclusivity are found articulated again in the 6th century um, the encyclopedic brihat sanhita this text again in more than 20 verses exhaustively enumerates you really have to see these original texts to understand the surprise exhaustively enumerates the many regions and peoples that were part of india again they mention among others kashmir and peshawar in the north up to dravidas kerala and karnataka down south while assam odisha and bengal of the east and saurashtra in the west and a whole lot of others in between so the sheer clarity and detail of this idea of india as a unity through her plurality so there is no fighting shy in these texts of her plurality they don't see it as uh, as anything to be uh, to cause unease they actually see it as very consistent with this unity as well and coming as this is from 1500 years ago it is it is mind boggling yet we don't teach this there's no mention of this in our classrooms and usually not even in the kind of research we do the crux of the matter is that the view that india was too vast and diverse to ever be one broad nation ignores the fact that the pre modern indian concept of country or nation could well recognize and embrace that vastness and diversity and how remarkable is that we talk of cultural pluralism today we talk of multicultural societies today but here is a recognition of that a clear statement of that uh, from from long ago and so so this concept of india this pre modern idea of india could well recognize and embrace this vastness and diversity both and acknowledge alongside a common unified sphere of cultural circulation so it's talking about is alluding to a common unified sphere of cultural circulation what do i mean by this i think there is no better illustration of of the society of india that is both diverse and unified both multiple and unitary than the stellar shankara Shankaracharya, a Sia intellectual who established the supremacy of transsectarian Vedanta Dwait. Now, Vedanta Dwait, as you know, uh, talks about a unified consciousness beyond multiplicity and form. Now, what did Shankara do? Why do I say he he exemplified this? Is the India, starting from his hometown of Kerala in Kerala, Shankara is said to have undertaken three famous big vijayas. towards a philosophical conquest of the land intensely debating and defeating the varied local scholarship right from kapalikas these are named in the text kapalikas and pashupatas to mimamsikas vaishnavas shaktas jainas and buddhas and overall first in tamil nadu then andhra vidarbha and karnataka where after he reaches gujarat onwards to ujjaini bahalika shurasen mathura Daradas, which is Gilgit and Baltistan, Puru Panchal, Punjab, Haryana, and then Kamarupa, Gaur, Bengal, and Koshala, UP. These are some of the places named. 
the fitting culmination of these Advaitic travels of Shankara was always each time. Where? In Kashmir. At the renowned center of all learning, the Sharada Peet, which is described as the Sarvagya Peet in, in um, the Shankara Dikvijaya. That is the seat of omniscience. But today, of course, this line derelict uh, across the line of <clears throat> control in, in POK. Indeed, the Shankaracharya temple at Srinagar still stands witness to this epic visit to Kashmir, or the memory of this epic visit to Kashmir has also to the incredible centrality of the far north of India to the imagination of its far south and vice versa. So Shankara actually epitomizes the centrality of the different extremities of India to each other's imagination. Others, why does this man set out to do this? There's no other reason except for the definite existence of a unified sphere of cultural circulation that is India. Shankara's choice reflects that. His choice of movement reflects that. Of course, famously, you know, he also inaugurated these four matters in, again, four cardinal directions. Why is he doing this? What is he speaking to? He's not some emperor. He's not someone who's trying to unify the country politically. So why is he doing this? He's clearly speaking to, he's clearly responding to a well-known, a well-acknowledged understanding of what constitutes <clears throat> the Indian ecumen. So I, I believe that Shankara's pan-Indian voyages rather subtly demonstrate this ancient idea of India. A sphere peopled by great diversity of thought, but unified by a consciousness which pierced through the multiplicity. Very quickly, by the 14th and 16th centuries, the name changes. So it's not just Bharat Varsha or Hindu or other things now. It changes to Hindu and to Hindustan, in Amir Khusro, and then in Abul Fazl, for example. But the reference point is very much the same territorial and cultural entities that their forebears had already attested. See, for example, what Abul Fazl says in the Ayn Yadbari, quote, the sea borders Hindustan on the east, west, and south. In the north, the great mountain ranges separate India from Turan, Iran, and China. So a clear understanding of not only what is India, but also what is not India. And he says, and he says, the president men of the past have considered Kabul and Kandahar. Please note, not the Indus River. Kabul and Kandahar as the twin gates of Hindustan. By guarding these, Hindustan obtains peace from the alien raiders. Unquote. The Tibetans, on the other hand, call India Ragya or Fagzul, the source country of their Buddhist masters. Their works like Lama Taranath's 16th century history of Buddhism in India, or later 18th century works, they all mention gurus from Fagzul belonging to where? What is their understanding of Fagzul? It is Kashmir and Peshawar to Andhra and Kanchipuram, Saurashtra and Bengal. Their gurus all coming from Fagzul are coming from such places. <laughs> so they have no ambiguity about what this land, this Fagzul is. And much earlier, I didn't have the time to list this for you, I've written about it, much earlier, a host of foreign accounts of travelers to India. Right from Agasthenes, Ptolemy, to Alberuni, and Swansang, all of them attest a very similar and clear understanding of what India is. And they use somewhat different names for her. So Indica, Indoi, Intu is what Swan Sun says, Tianchen, and so on. So what is the point I'm getting at? I'm saying thus on view again and again is staggering evidence for an enormous span of time and a variety of contexts of astonishing convergences in the perception or knowledge of what India was by whatever name you called her there, Bharat Varsha, Hindu, Hind, Indoi, Ragya, Fagzul, Hindustan, many different names, but all talking about the same, broadly the same area and the same people. So they're not necessarily identical in every respect, nor coterminous with present day boundaries. So we have to be very clear, I'm not trying to mix up the present with the past. The fact that there seems to be a great deal that continued to be held in common in the idea of India, across the centuries, by Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, and Jainas, by residents, as well as by foreign travelers, 
So two kinds of perception by pilgrims, poets, and chronicler itself deserves to be explored, deserves to be historicized. To deny these traditions of continuity where they may exist, even in the midst of so much historical movement and change in an ancient continuous living civilization like India, is surely to put a very riven politics above the pursuit of history. But history cannot be, this is something else I want to flag and I feel quite passionately about, history cannot be the study of only change. It cannot deny the continuities, it cannot suppress or brush away the continuities. Where there are civilizational continuities, that is not tantamount to being ahistorical. I have argued that those are actually trans-historical movements and traditions. And that, that tradition of preserving such continuity itself needs to be historicized. Finally, there is a second dimension to the historiography of this question of what India is. Clearly, it existed as a distinctive whole. But also, we may ask, what is India in terms of its relation to its thoughts? This is a fairly contentious issue today. Uh, regional identities, sub-regional identities versus national identities and so on. Now, when you ask this question of, of history, of the ancient or the medieval times, then typically you get one of two extreme reactions. You will either hear people talking of hegemonization, sweeping Sanskritization, earlier Aryanization. So you hear of this at one end or the other end you hear of complete autonomy and insularity of regions from the Indic mainstream. Kashmir, again, is a case in point, which you may know has been made out to be secluded, isolated, insular, and therefore unique. Whereas, as I've shown in my book, there is massive evidence, over 2,000 formalities of Kashmiri history for her, extensive connected histories with the entire rest of India, not just one or two parts, but going as far south as Tamilakam or Assam in the east or Malwa in Saurashtra in the west and across time, not just, and also processually, Kashmir actually partakes of many founding social material and cultural and political formations that the rest of India also did. I, I won't go into details of that here, but the point I'm making is that despite this massive evidence there has been complete, and I dare say willful or very politically convenient silence about this long durée historical Indic identity of Kashmir. So clearly there is an urgent need for reaffirming how we have been representing both our regions in history and the supra region called India by whatever name. This may sound like a nationalist project, but I prefer to see it as a project that would do justice to and make sense of the wealth of historical evidence at hand and also the multidimensionality of this phenomenon called India, which its history should surely be duty bound to reflect, capture and to explain. So to summarize, the challenges and opportunities both for Indian history right now, perhaps revolve around these very silences, omissions, elisions, and erasures in our pedagogy and our research. Whether these relate to the exclusion of histories of some regions like Kashmir on the one hand and the Northeast on the other, the different parts of the Northeast, we just don't teach them. And we don't teach them because we're not researching them or whether it is the neglect of the life history of India as a whole, or whether it is the need for reclamation of endogenous modes of history writing and their restitution at the international high table of academia. I repeat, not out of any provincialism or jingoism, but with a view to enriching, as it surely will, international discourse on the discipline of history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shonal Kaji. It was an awesome that was, lecture. Uh, that was magnificent. I'm just thinking, 
people in the US, I think Lavanyaji, it must be past 2 30 a.m. there now. That's that's okay, that's fine. It's time to wake them up. Okay. <laughs> pa Pankaji is sleeping or he's gone or what? Yeah, so he he has left, yeah. He has left. Okay. Good, good, good. Let him yeah. sleep in peace. Yeah. Now, because this paper, some people had some questions. So, uh, what we can do now, I'm just thinking aloud a little bit. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of things to say about Sonalika Ji's, uh, I think it was magisterial, magnificent. I was going to make a very irreverent joke about, anyhow, I won't, because what I'm trying to say is we're getting, I won't, I won't, but the, the, the real point is from Nirman to Nirvan, I think you've covered the entire terrain of the challenges and opportunities of Indian historiography today, especially, I think, especially uh, from that point of view of Tihas Mimamsa, because this is exactly what we've had. Uh, it rem reminds me of Mimamsa. We've got a Raju Shekhar's famous book. 8th, 9th century. And Itihad Mata actually requires all the things that uh, you, uh, you know, put into this, I think, magnificent talk. Of course, the idea of India, I mean, I think the first part for me was, was really very, very uplifting and enriching. The second part, yeah, we've been talking about some of these. And it's interesting how the Indo-Islamic world uh, was a bigger area, as it were, than this. So I think these definitions of uh, India, we also need to understand can be modified because the older India was probably a larger area than these definitions of, uh, you know, uh, some of the definitions that you have identified suggest the larger ecumeny, uh, a Sanskrit ecumeny also that uh, Sheldon Pollock identifies and so forth. So. Maybe there's an India and a greater India, you know, there's an osmosis there uh, in terms of its interactions. And of course, there's the India of the mind, India as a, as a metaphysic, as Raja Rao says, there's India as a territory, but India is also metaphysics. So, I mean, there are all these flavors that came out of your talk. But I'm just going to do one little thing first when, before we have our open session, which is to invite uh, Dr. Uday Kulkarni uh, to say a few words to us. And the reason I'm bringing him in is our, uh, uh, you know, over the last two days, we're supposed to focus on, uh, you know, three things, uh, which is theory, methods, and practice. Now, the practice of history, we've heard to some extent from, from Andre Wink uh, and uh, from you as well, and from others, no doubt. But the reason I'm inviting uh, Dr. Uday Kulkarni, first of all, he's a medical doctor. He's a surgeon from the Air Force. And he's produced a huge amount of, of, of uh, writing. And yesterday afternoon, you heard the crib about the, you know, confinements and contradictions of institutional uh, location. And we write histories. Uh, and we were problematizing these locations, uh, right from Mill, where you know you can write a closet history. But I think history is uh, today. History is exciting in India. Historiography is exciting, exciting because it's moved out of some of those confines. And uh, you have someone like uh, like Dr. Uday Kulkarni, and I wanted him to share his experience of rewriting or revisiting the history of the Marathas or the Maratha period and his own experiences uh, in this endeavor. Because the, one of the things I wanted to mention yesterday, uh, uh, you know, uh, Saradindu uh, Mukherjee, uh, G, uh, Professor Saradindu Mukherjee talked about, you know, how people were not getting grants. Oh, can you hear me at all or have I disappeared? Can anybody hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Very, very clear. Uh, am I, okay, thank you so much because we are going through. So, I, I mean, we are doing unconventional things. We had a dropout yesterday. And after a valedictory address, I'm going to invite someone to share his experience of being a historian outside 
of the academy. And I want to mention only one more thing about him. You see, we were talking about lack of resources, fellowships yesterday. What about publishing? Try and get your stuff published. And there are gatekeepers. There are all kinds of barriers. So Dr. Kulkarni publishes his own work. It's a very high quality publication. I can tell you, I was at the launch of, virtual launch of one of his books, the, I think, uh, on now, the new one, Nana <laughs> Sahib, The Century of, of a fantastic book. It's so beautifully produced as well. Uh, so, and, and I think it, it's a going concern. He's made it, uh, I think he's made it financially viable. So here's somebody who's doing in a very Punekar fashion. You see, people from Pune are like that. They decide to do something. They don't care about anybody. You see, they will run marathons. Someone will start a museum. And, uh, uh, you know, they don't care. Look, if you support them, you don't support them. You attack them. You don't attack them. You give them a job. You don't give them a job. They'll just pick up something they want to do, whether it's writing or writing histories, and they'll do it. So I want to invite uh, Dr. Kulkarni to just tell us his experience as a as a historian outside of the academy, who's produced this wonderful work, and uh, and uh, to share the practice of writing history, and and the topic I'd given him was uh, rewriting or revisiting the Maratha period. And after that, we'll have an open discussion. And except uh, Lav Lavanya Ji, we are really torturing her, keeping her up. No, I no. Think the rest, the rest of us, the rest of us can 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 have a little bit of a chit chat after this, because a wonderful sharing has occurred. I'm very very grateful to everyone who participated. So, uh, Dr. Kul, all is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Paranspe, and it's a real privilege to be amongst such an elite panel of historians today. I feel like I've strayed into an academy gathering, but thanks all the same, and I'll try to answer some of your questions that you've put up right now. I always had this uh, itch for history right from my school days and probably wrote my first book in a sc in school on a school notebook. Then, of course, you know, you go into medical field 35 years, you're out of it, but you keep reading what you like and which was history. And uh, because my grandfather was a teacher of history, I had his library to fall back upon and I could, uh, I mean, I got interested into the Mughal and the Maratha period at that point in time. And as I kept on reading, uh, sometime around, 10 or 11 years back, I started feeling that this, uh, the kind of history which is projected to the for the layman and which uh, is uh, basically, a, as I say, the, the Rankian uh, uh, model of uh, narrative history based on uh, original sources. That's what I was uh, more interested in. I wanted to present an unbiased view of what history actually is. And that I found was lacking in many of the places that, uh, many of the books that I read. And therefore, I began with a, on the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Panipat, I began with an, thinking I'll write an essay which will correct the perceptions of the battle that enlarged into a monograph and finally it led to a book. Of course, there was no time at that time to really find a publisher. So I said, okay, I'll put some of my own money, publish it. And I published it. And of course, that same money has been recycling itself into various books, about six original books, a few translations and so on. So that has been the model that I have followed. I never go to a publisher because the books, the manuscript lies on the shelf for six to eight months, and then they decide whether to fund it. I'm very keen that the production of the books is entirely under my control. Having said that, I'll just get back to the philosophy of why I wrote this about this period. I found that there's a lot of misrepresentation going on in the way uh, 17th and 18th century history was projected and even till the very end, even till to this day, you find very popular historians uh, saying the East India Company took off from the Mughal Raj, which I find, uh, you know, it's a question of reach today, how far, how many more people you can reach in the, what you're trying to say and uh, push your narrative as far as possible. But this is uh, galling, I would say, in the present day and age, because it is definitely misrepresentation, uh, misrepresenting history has occurred. And I, I've tried to correct that. So in a way, if you find my books to be slightly tilted towards a particular direction, it's probably my fault because it's a reaction to what came before. And at all times, I make it a point to make sure that I correct what I am, what is uh, being written by others and not let it influence what I'm trying to put across. Because my 
intention is to write unbiased based on facts, based on uh, proper contemporary references. And uh, from that point of view, the uh, writing has proceeded. And after Panipat, I wrote a book on the era of Bajira, which again was not a uh, biography. It was more of a story of a period, but because he was the most prominent person at that point in time, it was called the era of Bajira. Last year, Professor Paranshi was kind enough to help me release the extraordinary epoch of Nana Sahib Peshwa, which again is the mid 18th century, which I consider a crossroad in Indian history. And again, I've discussed Bengal, I've discussed Karnataka, the Anglo-French rise and so on. So it's a process and I hope that I complete this in the next 10 years, by which time I hope to uh, finish uh, till 1818, when the British actually took over from the Marathas. And 1802, for example, 1803, when the uh, capital Delhi, the so-called ancient capital of India was again taken by the British from the forces of the Sindhyas. So this is the narrative which I'm trying to put across. And I'm not trying to put it across in a manner where it will only appeal to academicians. I want the lay people of India to understand what I'm writing. So it is written in a conversational tone, shorn of most of the academic uh, uh, terms which are used in academia, because I want to reach out to the people on the ground. And that is the purpose of this whole exercise. At the same time, the book will also appeal to academia because there is enough uh, material which will back up what I say in those books. So that is my intention. That is the method which I'm following. And I hope it makes a dent somewhere into the basic foundation of all history. Uh, that is narrative history. And that is what I'm focusing on right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have uh, uh, you know, read the book, and I can tell you that they're very uh, well substantiated with original sources as well as uh, they also refer to the early. And I think after after Jadunath Sarkar and Sardesai, I think this period and this uh, area of history, I can't think of anybody who has explored it as thoroughly, as diligently. And in a way, as uh, as uh, uh, painstakingly as uh, as uh, Dr. Uday Kulkarni. So please stay with us. Others may have questions for you, and uh, I, I completely, I mean, resonate to some of the things you said. Uh, not only as a Maharashtrian, but you know, when Mill started writing his history of British India, he started in 1806 and he finished in 18. 17, I think, the first edition came out. In 1818 is when the Marathas lost the Battle of Koregaon. So uh, it's interesting that Brit the British Empire itself was undergoing, you know, enormous expansion and change, even as he was writing this history. And it's enormous. Why? Because he was getting paid, you see. He was on the payroll of the East India Company. So, and just a couple of things I wanted to say and then throw it open, uh, you know, some the things that Shonalika ji said, fantastic stuff. I remember reading uh, uh, Ranjit Pandit's translation of the Raja Tarangini, completed at Naini Jail, where he was with his brother-in-law, because Jawala Nehru was also imprisoned in the same jail. And Ranjit Pandit was the husband of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, and of course, the father of uh, Nantara Sahagal. We're going to invite her to speak as a witness to an era. But the point really is that Ranjit Pandit came out of jail and died, and he was up maybe 50, 52. And uh, I was reading, you know, some of his observations, and they, uh, you know, it really bears reading because this, uh, you know, welcoming with one hand, rejecting with another, uh, shows how we straight-jacketed ourselves. Uh, because we we imposed upon our texts and textual traditions, you know, these criterion, uh, criteria which were, in a sense, uh, you know, a part of uh, the colonial enterprise, which was also an enterprise of the mind. It was very much a, an enterprise of knowledge, as we all know. And I think Shonalika ji is showing us a way, uh, uh, but uh, of Kavya as, as, as Itihas, or Kavya Itihas, but I don't know how many more texts we can uh, use apart from Kalhana, which was my original, uh, my first question to her. And uh, I completely agree that the multi-generic, the ornamental, 
all these cannot be used to dismiss this body of knowledge because if we did it our uh, you know metallurgical texts our mathematical texts lilavati you know we would have to dismiss all of it because a lot of it was written in verse we would have to dismiss a lot of our ayurvedic texts so i mean we will have to come to terms with this now why was i saying an improved enhanced version i won't name anybody you know uh, and as i said it's a bit irreverent because when you see the terminator as a movie you keep getting newer and enhanced versions but what i'm trying to say is one of the star versions who my uh, you know big big star i mentioned right at the beginning i mean her knowledge of sanskrit is very dodgy you see so what i'm saying is i'm so glad that j a new improved i think a new generation version of of a historian we do justice uh, to uh, our, our sources i don't know if i you hear me or you lost me at that crucial juncture i think we are very proud in jane shoes uh, you know and really you know take this tradition jane's magnificent tradition of history ancient history to new heights i really very proud of you shonalika ji uh, i mean you you studied in jnu but you also studied in st stephen's my alma mater so we we share two institutions one where i've not studied thankfully but taught at for ever so long grown old teaching in jnu but very proud of you so now the whole everything is open now people can say whatever they want to say and can ask whatever they want to ask uh, uh, and we can if you want to address professor andre wink you can do that or uh, or dr sonali ka call or dr kulkarni or anybody each other or lavanya ji so the floor is open thank you just raise your hands and then i can call on you if i can't see you then aha uh-huh, balram ji i can see his hand balram ji please please aap uh, sawal kijiye जी 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 सर और संस्क, आप संस्कृत में भी कर सकते हैं सवाल उतनी <laughs> तो सं, हम समझ पाएंगे और <laughs> जो उत्तर देना होगा वो सिर्फ सोनालिका जी संस्कृत में दे सकते हैं लेकिन <laughs> प्रश्न तो हम सारे समझ पाएंगे अतीव सुंदर सुंदरी प्रस्तुति ही सोनालिका महाभाग त्र बहव बिंदव तथा आसन अस्माकोध भवि शक्नोति पुनस्त संरक्षण तत्र सुधार भवि शक्नोति तथा मम एक प्रश्न वर्तते अथवा किंचि उत्प्रेक्षण द्रष्ट शक्नोति मम ध्वनि श्रूयते अभी श्रूयते मम ध्वनि तस्य न श्रूयते कौल महाभागा न श्रूयते अंतर्जाधा सद्यपिहास अथ च काम अनोर्मे अत्य सम्मिश्रण अस्ति ओवरलैपिंग यथय शक्य है आवाजाही कथ्य है तथा इतिहासे काव्ये च किंचित स्पष्टम अंतरम कृतमस्ति यथा साहित्यक कथितिहास किंचि भिन्न वस्तु वर्तते काव्यासम त्र वर्तते स्वभावोक्ति अथ च काव्ये भवति काव्ये किंचित विशेषोक्ति अस्ति वक्रोक्ति अस्ति इतिहासे स्वभावोक्ति तथा भूतस्य वचनस्य कथनम इति वृत्त निर्वाहणम साहित्य दर्पण कार कथयति अहम उद्धरामि नहि कवेह इति वृत्त निर्वाहणेन आत्मपद लाभः तो इतिहास और कविता में अंतर है ओ ये ये हमारे हमारी परंपरा में भी ये बात कही गई है साहित्य दर्पणकार विश्वनाथ कविराज कहते हैं कि कवि जो है वो केवल घटनाओं के वर्णन मात्र से 
आत्म पद लाभ नहीं कर सकता मतलब उसको कवित्व का लाभ उसको पोएट नहीं कहा जा सकता इसी बात को धनंजय ने जो दसवीं शताब्दी के हैं दश रूपककार वो कहते हैं कि जब प्लॉटिंग करता है कोई लेखक या कोई कवि तो यदुचितम वस्तु उसको फ्री हैंड है वो राम की कथा में भी कुछ अंतर कर सकता है यदुचितम वस्तु नायक से रसस्य वा नायक के चरित्र या जो ओवरऑल रस को हम कम्युनिकेट करना चाहते हैं उसके विरुद्धम तत्परित्याज्यम अन्यथा वा प्रकल्प तो मेरा मेरे कहने का तात्पर्य संक्षेप में ये है कि यद्यपि दोनों में ओवरलैपिंग बहुत ज्यादा है तथा अपनी अस्माकम परंपरायाम भिन्नम अंतरम कृतम अस्ति केवलम लक्ष्यम एकम अस्ति लक्ष्य जैसे आपने कहा कि चतुर्वर्ग है या उपदेशात्मक है तो चतुर्वर्ग तो हमारे यहाँ जितने भी कार्य हैं सबका लक्ष्य चतुर्वर्ग होता है लेकिन दोनों की स्टाइल थोड़ी भिन्न जरूर होती है और राज तरंगिणी निश्चित रूप से बहुत महत्वपूर्ण इस दृष्टि से है कि दोनों का सम्मिश्रण है तो कविता के अंशों का काव्यांशों का इतिहास के रूप में जब हम उपयोग करें तो हमें सावधान रहना चाहिए क्योंकि हमारी परंपरा भी इन दोनों के मध्य के स्पष्ट अंतरों को समझती है धन्यवाद जी 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 बिल्कुल ठीक है गुरुदा जी कहिए इसका क्या जवाब है मुझे नहीं लगता वो उसका मिश्रण मिटा, मिटाना चाहती थी बिल्कुल भी मिटाना नहीं चाहती थी मिश्रण उनका आई I मीन mean, उनमें जो डिस्टिंक्शन है लेकिन कहने का मतलब ये है कि काव्य तो एक चीज है लेकिन जो महाभारत है जिसको इतिहास कहा जाता है वो भी छंदों में ही लिखा है है ना तो हम दो तरह की चीज बोल रहे हैं यहाँ पे अगर हम कालिदास को मान के चलें इतिहास है तो उसको इतिहास कोई नहीं कहेगा लेकिन सवाल गहरा भी है सोनालिका जी बो, बोलेंगी इस पर लेकिन मुझे एक ही छोटी टिप्पणी करनी है आज के जो हमारे सबसे जो मशहूर इतिहासकार है वो भी आ, जो उपन्यास है उनको पढ़ रहे हैं आप तनिका सरकार जी को पढ़िए दीपेश चक्रवर्ती जी को पढ़िए इनको भी सोर्स माना जा रहा है तो ये नहीं कह रहे कि ये उस तरह के डॉक्यूमेंट हैं जिस तरह का कोई दूसरा डॉक्यूमेंट होगा जैसे होगा या कोई दूसरी चीज होगी लेकिन उसको भी सोर्स माना जा रहा है तो पढ़ने का तरीका एक चीज है और डॉक्यूमेंट में जो फर्क है वो दूसरी चीज है तो ये मुझे लग रहा है कि इन दोनों में हमें भेद एक तो क्षमा चाहती हूँ मेरा इंटरनेट एन उसी मौके पे गया जब आप मेन पार्ट बोल रहे थे शुक्र जी लेकिन जो मैं समझ पाई हूँ मंत्री के रिस्पॉन्स से भी जो मैं समझ पाई हूँ उस, उसमें मुझे यही कहना है कि आइदर और का सवाल ही नहीं है और मैंने हिस्टोरिकल मेथड्स इन अर्ली इंडिया पे अलग काफी लिखा है और सोचा है जहाँ एक पूरी रेंज अवेलेबल होती है मैं ये काफी कह रही कि सिर्फ जो काव्य का मोड ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल रिप्रेजेंटेशन है वही एक इंडिक हिस्टोरिकल मोड था मैं ये नहीं कह रही वहाँ मैं आपको एक आर्टिकल भी भेज सकती हूँ जो मैंने लिखा था वगैरह जिसमें मैं गिनाती हूँ कि क्या अलग अलग मोड्स रहे हैं इंडिक हिस्टोरिकल विजन से भी उनमें ये सारा एरिया कवर हो जाता है फ्रॉम द इम्पेरिकल टू टू द इमेजिनेटिव इफ यू लाइक एंड इमेजिनेटिव इज नॉट नेसेसरली फिक्शनल दैट इज माई पॉइंट कि हम ये जो हमारे मानसिकता में ये एक भेद बैठ चुका है वो पॉजिटिविस्ट वो मॉडर्निस्ट है उसके रूट्स हम समझें क्योंकि हमको ये कंडीशनिंग दी गई है कि जो सत्य है वो केवल तथ्य है और मुझे तथ्यों से कोई पैर नहीं है आई आई डोंट द प्रॉब्लम इज नॉट एन ऑब्जेक्शन टू इम्पेरिकल ट्रूथ्स in in history the problem is when you don't allow for there the existence of truths beyond the empirical beyond the verifiable you know paul wayne talks about this in the context of greek mythology for example and he says that um, it's represented not the, not the real as true but the noble as true to ye jo transcendent truth values hain उनको मेरे हिसाब से जो इंडिक हिस्टोरिकल विजन है वो बार बार निरंतर हमें याद दिलाता है तथ्यों के द्वारा तो दोनों में कोई विपरीतार्थक नहीं है ये दो चीजें एंड मैं मानती हूँ जैसे मकरन जी ने भी कहा कि सिर्फ जब मैं काव्य कह रही हूँ वो सिर्फ एक किस्म के टेक्स्ट नहीं है आप पद्धति की बात है सब कुछ मेथड की बात है 
कि हमें ऐसे मेथड्स इन्वॉल्व करने हैं जो उस पर्टिकुलर टेक्स्ट या जॉनर या एपिग्राफ या जो भी सोर्स हो उससे जस्टिस करें तो फिर कालिदास का भी जो रघुवंशम है उसे भी हम ठीक वंशावली के तौर पे पढ़ सकते हैं उसे भी हम ठीक राज तरंगनी के तौर पे पढ़ सकते हैं बहुत सारी समानताएं हैं लेकिन फिर भी उसको वो दर्जा नहीं दिया गया है क्योंकि मोटा मोटी कालिदास को माना गया कि अरे ये तो सिर्फ एक इमेजिनेटिव पोइट है प्रॉब्लम इमेजिनेटिव होने का है ही नहीं प्रॉब्लम है हमारी जो डेफिनेशन ऑफ हिस्ट्री है वो समझ नहीं पा रही है वो एक्सेस नहीं कर पा रही है उनका मोड ऑफ रिप्रेजेंटेशन क्योंकि जो पोएट्री या लिटरेचर है वो झूठ नहीं है कल्पना भी झूठ नहीं होती है कल्पना भी सिंबॉलिक होती है कि चीजों को कहने का तरीका अलग है लेकिन फिर भी वो कुछ तो कन्वे कर रहे हैं या तो यथार्थ के या हमारे यथार्थ के अनुभव का सो समिंग इज हिस्टोरिकल इन एवरी लिटरेरी रेप्रेजेंटेशन एंड दिस इज वट आई वुड से वेदर इज एक्सप्रेस इट और नॉट because even our imagination is a function of our response really to our experiences and to the acumen we find ourselves in so these are just some of the larger responses i was thinking of they are very very well put and very important because uh, i think uh, when we always talk about india and the west and so forth there are serious uh, differences in the way we conceive of the world conceive of our our place in the world our life in the world the nature of reality the nature of representation the nature of experience and certainly modernity as you rightly said uh, uh, is a kind of breach in the continuity of this and it's really the suturing and the reconnection a kind of pratyabhigya that is our challenge because unless we recognize ourselves i think this is a lost battle for, for, frankly speaking unless we recognize ourselves as a civilization and for which the national project as professor raghutam said is is an is an important prerequisite as a custodian of a civilizational vision so anyhow now i, I would i would request questions to uh, professor andre wink for for a while please uh, and i also apologize if he can't uh, if he didn't follow uh, some of our exchanges uh, in hindi and so uh, i would not call them vernacular sanskrit i'm just joking of course i'm sure he understands hindi i'm just kidding around as we come to the end of our uh, today uh, so please if anybody has a question for professor andre wink he he said very significant things uh, i think and uh, he he said that we did not have an ancient urban civilization uh, we we did not have empires he also talked about buildings i mentioned the sanchi stupa as also a stupa in sri lanka but one of the things i learned i was deeply fascinated by was the instability of urban life in in in, in pre modern india where you could you you would have to leave a city in a day you know the makeshift arrangement of, of what we call our cities and also how we said in cambodia the cities the fields were in the middle of the city so so a completely different notion of uh, of the urban why cambodia in delhi fields were inside what we call delhi you know just till 20 30 years ago people were doing uh, agriculture you know uh, you know right there and uh, institutions like iits uh, even jnu farmers lands were bought and there are villages within lal dora ye wo so i think that there are some very significant things that he mentioned but uh, if anybody has a question to professor wink please uh, please uh, mention it and the rural ban uh, he gave us that coinage and also the importance of climate and uh, the monsoon you know i think that uh, an environment the so called and uh, and uh, and nature or whatever traces as sources you know that is the different scripting of history not just documents or things written in stone but the traces of nature that is uh, rivers that disappeared or changed their course uh, like coastal like, changes its course every every year even now but i'm saying if if these are factored in we get a different picture of history medieval history he also talked about conversions happening among uh, coastal communities trading communities nomadic communities or entire Guild, entire, entire 
artisan artisanal oh. guilds or communities or jatis or or caste converting like julahas or uh, you know the the bhats who are singing in in rajasthan they're all muslim so the entire community so i mean there are many things he spoke about and we look forward to his uh, i mean i haven't read his new book which is a summary but he said it's only from the onset of modernity that uh, destiny was not equal to geography i think that was a brilliant point for me uh, that uh, but anyhow any questions for professor wink please raise them If not, the floor is open for other questions. Sir, I want to talk about Sonalika Ji. I want to talk about Sonalika Ji. Please give me a chance. Sonalika Ji, thank you very much. I think that in the way that I am thinking about these days, I am a human being, I am a human being, but I have been thinking about the relationship between the past 10-12 years of the past. और रिश्ता इतना गहरा है कि मुझे सपने में भी इतिहास आता है कभी-कभी और आज मुझे पहली बार लगा कि मैं साहित्य का विद्यार्थी होकर भी एक आपकी तरह सोचता हूँ बहुत-बहुत बधाई आपने बहुत महत्वपूर्ण बातें कही हैं और सबसे महत्वपूर्ण बात जो मुझे लगी कि भारत जैसे देश में हमारे जैसे देश में सार्वदेशिक इतिहास की अवधारणा पर पुनर्विचार किया जाना चाहिए आ, उसका एक कारण है हम छोटी छोटी सांस्कृतिक इकाइयों में विभक्त थे मध्यकाल में और आवागमन के साधन नहीं थे संचार के साधन नहीं थे तो इन इकाइयों का सांस्कृतिक विकास स्वायत्त ढंग से हुआ आ, अगर आप इन इकाइयों के सांस्कृतिक विकास विकास सांस्कृतिक इतिहास को नहीं जानते सांस्कृतिक आचरण को नहीं जानते तो आप भ्रामक निष्कर्षों पर पहुंच सकते हैं जैसे मैंने मीरा पढ़ा है मीरा मध्यकाल में एक सिद्धांत है ज्येष्ठता का सिद्धांत मतलब जो सबसे बड़ा है वही उत्तराधिकारी होगा राजा का बेटा विडंबना ये है कि सारे हिंदी साहित्य में और सारे जेंडर डिस्कोर्स में ये मान लिया गया कि मीरा के पति के साथ उसके रिश्ते तनावपूर्ण और द्वंद्वपूर्ण थे क्योंकि मीरा की कविता में राणा संबोधन बार बार आता है विडंबना यह है कि राणा संबोधन राणा संबोधन सब किया जाता है जब कोई सत्तारूढ़ हो जाता है अब ये सांस्कृतिक आग किसी को पता ही नहीं है कि न तो मीरा के पति कभी सत्तारूढ़ हुए ना मीरा के पिता कभी सत्तारूढ़ हुए दरअसल ये संबोधन उस समय अल्पकाल के लिए सत्तारूढ़ विक्रमादित्य और रत्न सिंह के लिए लेकिन ये मान लिया गया सारे हमारे स्त्री विमर्शकार ये मानते हैं कि ये पित्र सत्ता से जुड़ा हुआ मामला है मैं ए, एक और मुझे लगता है कि एक बात जो आपने और महत्वपूर्ण बहुत कही है वो ये है कि यदि आप पुरा लेखी पुरातात्विक आनुभविक और प्रत्यक्ष ये जो पश्चिमी इतिहास यूरोपीय इतिहास के मानक हैं इसी इन्हीं मानकों का इस्तेमाल करके भारतीय ढंग का इतिहास लिखने लिखने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो आप फिर वो जो महात्मा गांधी ने कहा था कि आपको बाघ तो बाघ बाघ का स्वभाव तो चाहिए बाघ नहीं चाहिए मुझे लगता है कि हमारी परंपरा अलग प्रकार के मानकों की अपेक्षा करती है पुराले एक पुरातात्विक साक्ष्य आपको गलत निष्कर्षों तक ले जा सकते हैं मैं आपको एक उदाहरण देकर बताता हूं जिस टेक्स्ट पर मैं काम कर रहा हूं पद्मिनी के संबंधित जिन टेक्स्टों पर मैं काम कर रहा हूं वहां यह हुआ है कि रत्न सिंह सारे आधुनिक इतिहासकारों ने रत्न सिंह के अस्तित्व को संदिग्ध मान लिया क्योंकि उसका पुरातात्विक जो अभिलेख है पुरालेख है उनमें उल्लेख नहीं विडंबना ये कि सारे देशज कथा काव्यों में इस बात को लेकर कोई विवाद नहीं है कि रत्नसेन 1303 में जब अलाउद्दीन ने आक्रमण किया 
तब वहां के शासक थे और पद्मिनी उनकी विवाहिता स्त्री थी लेकिन पुराने की साक्षियों में रत्न सिंह का उल्लेख नहीं मिलता अब इसका आ, आप जब तक आ, आप जब तक इस आ, सारी सांस्कृतिक आचरण को बेहतर ढंग से नहीं दरअसल हुआ ये कि राणा और रावल दो शाखाएं हैं वो एक छोटी सी जागीर का स्वामी है रावल शाखा के राणा शाखा के लोग वो शिशोदा है अब आप देखिए कि हमीर के रत्न सिंह की मृत्यु के बाद रावल राणा शाखा के लोग सत्तारूढ़ हो गए उन्होंने अपनी वंशावलियां लिखवाई शिलालेख बनवाए उनमें रत्न सिंह का उल्लेख नहीं मिलता अब विडंबना यह है कि ये बात आधुनिक इतिहासकारों में से अधिकांश को पता ही नहीं है और उन्होंने ये मान लिया कि रत्न सिंह भी नहीं हुआ और हरा साहब वो आखिरी चीज एक और बार बोले जो दो शाखाएं हैं उनके बारे में आप कह रहे थे सर दरअसल ये है कि जैसे बोले ये बीच में इंटरनेट चला गया सर हुआ ये कि एक परंपरा है गुहिल परम गुहिल शासक है मेवाड़ के अब ये कि रत्न अल्लाउद्दीन ने आक्रमण किया तो रत्न सिंह गुहिल परंपरा से आता है और दूसरी सारे लोग भी गुहिल है लेकिन रत्न सिंह की मृत्यु हो जाती अलाउद्दीन के आक्रमण के समय और शिशोदा का एक सामंत जो उसके अधीनस्थ एक सामंत है वो सत्तारूढ़ होता है अलाउद्दीन कुछ समय तक सत्तारूढ़ रहता है और उसके बाद वो अलाउद्दीन को पदच्युत करके उनके उसको हटाकर और सत्तारूढ़ हो जाता अब मुश्किल ये है कि जो सत, राणा शाखा के लोग हैं अपनी वंशावली लिखवा रहे हैं पूरी की पूरी महाराणा कुंभा तक यही हो रहा है और उन सभी शिला लेखों में रत्न सिंह का उल्लेख नहीं मिलता अब ये लोगों ने मान लिया कि रत्न सिंह हुआ है जबकि राणा शाखा का कोई भी जो शिला लेखों में उल्लेखित व्यक्ति है वो मेवाड़ में कभी सत्तारूढ़ ही नहीं है तो मुझे शिशोड़ो ने लिखा है शिशो शिदो शिशोदो ने लिखा है रतन सिंह के बारे में नहीं अब ये क्या है दो विवाद है र, कुछ शिला लेख कहते हैं कि रत्न सिंह हुए कुछ लेख शिला लेख कहते हैं रत्न सिंह नहीं हुए लेकिन जो हमारे देशज कथा काव्य है ऐतिहासिक कथा काव्य है उन सब में रत्न सिंह नायक है, है और पद्मिनी नायिका है एक और बात जो मैं कहना चाहता हूँ कि ये धारणा निराधार और निर्मूल है कि भारतीयों में इतिहास चेतना नहीं है विश्व के किसी भी और भूभाग की तुलना में भारतीयों में इतिहास चेतना है मैं हाँ आपको देखिए विश्व के किसी भाग में रानियों के रानियों के इतिहासकार नहीं मिलेंगे हमारे यहाँ रानी मंगा है जो रानियों की वृत्ति पर निर्भर करते हैं रानियां उनकी आजीविका के लिए उत्तरदायी है वे रानियों की वंशावली लिखते हैं रानियों की संतति लिखते हैं हमारी छोटी जातियों के जिनको आप दलित कहते हैं उन जातियों के भी अपने चारण और भाट है हमारी दूसरी जातियां जैसे जैन जाति उनके यहाँ यति है वे वंशावलियां लिखते हैं दरअसल हमने इन सारे अभिलेखों को वंशावली अभिलेखों को और इनको अभी ठीक से पढ़ा ही नहीं है ठीक से देखा ही नहीं है ए, एक और बात जो मुझे मुझे कहनी चाहिए अभी बलराम जी जो बात कह रहे थे आ, मुझे लगता है कि हमारे यहाँ जो आप इतिहास की हमारी अपनी परंपरा को कथा और काव्य से अलग करके नहीं देख सकते उसका जरूरी हिस्सा है कथा के और कविता के रूढ़िया कवि समय अभिप्राय ये तीनों हमारी इतिहास परंपरा का हिस्सा है आप उनको अभिदेय अर्थ में लेकर देखेंगे मोहम्मद हबीब ने एक बात कही कि लोगों को सपने देखने पर रोक तो नहीं लगाई जा सकती ना देखेंगे वो भी है उसमें लेकिन आप उनको अलग करके भारतीय परंपरा को समझना चाहते हैं राज तरंगणी का भी पूर्वार्ध का इतिहास पूरा का पूरा मितकी है लेकिन जैसा आनंद कुमार स्वामी ने एक बहुत, बहुत मिथक की बहुत शानदार व्याख्या की उन्होंने कोष्टक में लिखा इतिहास वो, वो हमारी परंपरा का हिस्सा मिथक का प्रस्थान भी यथार्थ से ही होता है 
ये मेरा निराधार धारणा है कि मृतक मिथ्या और निराधार है मुझे लगता है कि इन इन टेक्स्ट को मीरा को पढ़ते हुए और इन टेक्स्ट को पढ़ते हुए अच्छा आप कल कहेंगे कि एक टेक्स्ट है पाठनामा अब ये पारंपरिक टेक्स्ट है कि किसी यूरोपियन को ये कभी समझ में नहीं आएगा कि वो सदियों से चली आती हुई परंपरा है एक पिता ने लिखा बेटे को दिया बेटे ने लिखा फिर पोते को दिया और वो सदियों से चला आप कहेंगे कि ये दस्तावेज किस समय लिखा गया उसमें सोलहवीं शताब्दी का भी है अठारहवीं शताब्दी का भी है उन्नीसवीं शताब्दी को बुलर ने पृथ्वीराज रासो का प्रकाशन रुकवा दिया जबकि पृथ्वीराज रासो ए, एक पारंपरिक रचना है हमारी रचनाएं इसी तरह की है हम स्मृति को रख रखाव इसी तरह करते हैं और, और कोई तरीका नहीं रविन्द्रनाथ टैगोर ने बहुत अच्छी बात कही सभी खेतों में एक जैसी फसल नहीं होती आप ये आग्रह क्यों करें कि हमारी फसल यूरोप जैसी फसल ही हो और वो यूरोप जैसी नहीं है तो फसल भी नहीं है हैं ये 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 आग्रह सिरे से गलत हैं उन्होंने कहा आप धान के खेत में बैंगन ढूंढने जाएंगे हैं और अगर बैंगन नहीं मिलेगा तो आप कह देंगे कि धान की प्रजाति ही नहीं है मुझे लगता है कि भारतीय इतिहास परंपरा को रविन्द्रनाथ टैगोर ने बहुत महत्वपूर्ण बातें कही है और वो बहुत आरंभिक दौर में कही है इस इतिहास परंपरा को समझने के लिए आपको सारे टूल विडंबना ये है कि वे लोग जो भारतीय इतिहास लेखन का दावा कर रहे हैं वे भी टूल वे ही इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं जो यूरोपीय और यूरोपीय अनुवर्ती लोग करते हैं मुझे लगता है कि इन टूल्स को नए सिरे से सबसे पहले जैसा आज सोनालिका जी ने कहा कि इस मेथोडोलॉजी को सबसे पहले बदलने की जरूरत है उसके बिना आप किसी युक्ति संगत निष्कर्ष पर पहुंचेंगे इसकी गुंजाइश बहुत कम है एक मुझे लगता है मध्यकालीन जितने स्रोत हैं ख्यात बही पाठनामा रासो उ, उ, उनके भीतर जो नियोजित कथा रूढ़िया और कवि समय है अब जैसे ऋतु वर्णन है वो होगा हमारी परंपरा में हमारी कवि शिक्षा का हिस्सा है अभिप्राय है तो वो रहेंगे अब आप रत्न सेन सिंगल दीप विवाह करने गया ये ये कल्पना जायसी की नहीं है हमारे कथा काव्यों में ये परंपरा कर कंडुचरी प्रण शेरी कहा निव कहा लीला वही कहा इन सब में वो वहां जा रहा है आप इसका युक्तिकरण मत रैशनलाइजेशन मत कीजिए ये कथा रूढ़ी है रैशनलाइज करेंगे रैशनलाइज करेंगे कुछ मैं मैंने देखा आधुनिक इतिहास का रैशनलाइज कर रहे थे उसको कि किस मार्ग से गया होगा इतना दूर कैसे गया होगा और बड़े इतिहासकार कर रहे थे तो आ, 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 ये जायसी ने ये सिरे से गलत धारणा है कि जायसी ने सबसे पहले इसकी कल्पना की हमारे कथा काव्यों में ये परंपरा बहुत पहले से चली आ रही है और अब आप देखिए इतिहासकारों ने ये भी कह दिया बहुत सारों ने कि ये चित्तौड़ चित्रकूट है ही नहीं पद्मावत में उन्होंने कहा कि ये प्रयाग के पास इलाहाबाद के पास एक जगह है मॉडर्न हिस्टोरियन बड़े नाम नहीं लूंगा मैं अभी आ, आप आश्चर्य करेंगे कि पद्मावत में भी चित्तौड़ का भूगोल चित्तौड़ के आसपास के कस्बों के नामों ले ऐसा नहीं है लेकिन फिर भी बहुत बहुत विचित्र तरह की स्थितियां हैं आप सारी टर्मिनोलॉजी बदलने की जरूरत है जी बिल्कुल बिल्कुल बहुत अच्छी बात कही आप कि इतना गैप होगा तो वही वर्णन कैसे आ रहे हैं मतलब बीच में भी परंपरा रही होगी अच्छा लावण्या जी वेरी वेरी स्लीपी नाउ आई थिंक यू शुड से योर पीस लावण्या जी एंड देन देन वी विल क्लोज इट टू बिकॉज आई थिंक इट मस्ट बी वॉट अबाउट फोर ओ क्लॉक थ्री थर्टी दी कॉन्ट हेयर यू गो हैड गो हैड प्लीज प्लीज maybe we should wind up because uh, uh, unless uh, yeah, almost, you must first speak you must first speak 4 o'clock that's what i thought and then i think professor agotham others may have a few words in shonalika ji but first you two, and then and then i think you should uh, uh, you know have, have give yourself a good rest go ahead okay all right uh, thank you very much um i would like to thank uh, all the participants uh, as we conclude 
um i would uh, request everybody to take a relook uh, at history uh, and my contention is always with uh, aryan theory for the aryan theory i would request everybody to look at other evidence uh, rather than the linguistic evidence uh, and reconsider the, that that's what i urge um, and uh, today's participants uh, um the beginning with uh, professor andrew wink uh, and uh, professor pankaj jain uh, and uh, professor shunal kaji and uh, dr kulkarni ji uh, all of you have uh, given an excellent uh, presentation and uh, thank you very much um, i want to record special thanks um so i i would like to thank every everyone who gave the lectures today and yesterday uh, professor venkatragottam ji and saradindu ji professor saradindu ji and uh, nalini ji uh, and i want to give my special thanks to uh, professor makran parajpe for inviting me uh, to give this uh organize this uh, symposium i thank all the distinguished speakers for their excellent lectures and opening up the discussion on important aspects of indian history uh, and i thank all the participants who took part in the symposium enthusiastically and sent their comments and valuable questions through email and social media platform i thank all the participants for their valuable uh, support thank you everybody. thank you thank you lavanya ji thank you most of all for organizing this it's gone really well and i might add that please send your papers uh, to lavanya ji so that we think about a volume uh, i think we talk a lot in india but uh, at least at iis we believe in producing something we've produced more than 500 books maybe 700 books and i haven't counted but more than 500 i can assure you and of these about 20 25 books have come out just in the corona period uh, so i think we should continue this uh, this trend so please send in your papers to lavanya ji uh, thank you all for joining and uh, if somebody wants to say something more please say it uh, i personally want to thank all the participants i want to thank uh, all the people lavanya ji thanks so i don't want to repeat but uh, if anyone wants to say anything please go ahead and i want to then give the last word uh, to professor chakravarti to bless us he's more than 80 years old so i will give the microphone to him at the end just to close it but till then if anyone wants to say anything uh, please go ahead professor agottam would you like to say something i'll also call on shonalika ji uh, professor <laughs> agottam i i think this uh... a uh, two day workshop or webinar was extremely useful for two reasons one we are all aware of the fact that indian history has been essentially an exercise in obscuring the facts in obfuscation rather than explicating uh, the reality of india's very very complex past 70 years as i have tried to show in my uh, paper yesterday we have been essentially uh chasing the wrong um idea of history and thanks to uh, prof, uh, dr shunelaka uh, dr calls uh, uh, uh lecture today we know that uh, the indian texts do encapsulate a vision of history which is extremely rich which is extremely complex and uh informed uh by a very interesting ideas of theory literary theory and this is no different from what we can see uh in the greek tradition as well because history has always been memoria and we have always regarded history as part of smriti this idea of uh, memoria uh, uh, uh incarnating itself has history or itihasa his um, i i think very germane to the understanding of this new dimension of history i i i um, i i've also been 
extremely disillusioned uh, with the way in which uh, some schools of history, particularly those associated with Delhi University, JNU, Aligarh Muslim University, and a few other universities have tried to hijack the entire writing of history for essentially a political purpose. And there is nothing wrong in a political purpose, provided it is not divisive. If uh, you if you play uh, use history for projecting a grander vision of uh, of India, uh, I I personally would have ha would have no uh, difficulty with that. But if history is hijacked purely for very very partisan uh, political purposes, uh, uh, making it very divisive, making it very identity oriented, making it very regional oriented, I I think we are doing this, the study of history a great deal of harm. And it is through such workshops that I think a new vision of history needs to be inculcated. I think that, that I completely agree with Professor uh, Paranjipai's idea that a book has to be brought out. And I think we should make this book part of the reading uh, material of most of the universities because you know, the students are not aware that history can be uh, can have other dimensions. And I think, and, and in India, where there is censorship from the academia, serious censorship from the academia, in, uh, a very intolerant uh, uh, academia. I have myself, uh, you know, suffered uh, as a consequence of that. I have a PhD uh, uh, from Professor Burton Stein himself. Uh, and, and I have known, uh, I have seen how I was made to suffer humiliated by the profession of uh, historians um, because I happen to be very independent minded. I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, follow the pack. I'm not a pack animal. I, and uh, so uh, I, I have been very independent and I believe that history must have some contact with truth and history is not ideology. I have never used history to promote any ideology and I have suffered professionally because of that. And I'm glad that a more uh, inclusive version of history is now being forged and I thank Professor uh, uh, Makran Paranjipe and all the different uh, institutions, including the government of India, that is making it possible. For 70 years, we have stifled uh, the writing of history. We have stifled, I would even say, strangled the writing of history. Uh, Professor Uday Kulkarni is an example of how uh, a rich history can be written even outside of the academia. And in the, in the academia, what we have done is pro provide a pabulum that, uh, 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 th that is acceptable, uh, uh, like what you can call uh, a kind of a the boot camp of political parties. That pabulum uh, no longer passes muster. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, thanks to this workshop, I think a movement can, be, can begin for rewriting, reshaping, reconceptualizing history. One last point I would like to make, most Indian historians don't read uh, the primary, I'm, I'm talking about ancient and medieval historians, they don't read uh, the primary sources. That's why you have this mad rush towards modern history, because you, know, you can get the sources in English. Why everyone wants to specialize in modern history? They don't want to study medieval or ancient history because you have to learn epigraphy, you have to learn Sanskrit, you have to learn Pali, or you, have, you know, and, and so on. And for medieval history, you just read uh, Eliot and Dawson. But I think, uh, you know, uh, from what we, uh, from uh, Dr. Call's wonderful lecture, I was really very impressed. I really enjoyed the lecture. Um, you know, we know the importance of. Uh, 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 being very familiar with the language. I myself know a little bit of Sanskrit, but then I work mostly on South Indian material. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't, uh, you know, I work on Vijayanagara and Chola history, but I'm, I'm glad that the emphasis on language has once more begun. Um, the, uh, uh, the methodology of history is becoming more precise and less polemical and more inclusive, more um, uh, uh, and more oriented towards capturing the reality of the past rather than rationalizing it for the present. Thank you. Well said, well spoken. I think Lavanya ji really needs to retire. She's messaging me, don't feel guilty. Uh, I'm sure our words will sort of seep into your, uh, your unconscious and they'll be nice and uplifting. So uh, I should say good night or good morning. 
And of course, we'll be in touch. Thank you. You've done a fantastic job. Uh, thank you again. So, so sleep well. I think, uh, yes. Bye. Bye, Lavanya ji. Now, I think uh, Jami wants to say thing. Please go ahead and I'll call Shonalika ji also. And uh, I hope, Dilipda, are you ready to conclude our uh, two-day event, sir? Will you, uh, will you please uh, help to conclude it? If Professor Andre Wink wants to say something, I see Pandita ji has also raised her finger, but only 30 seconds now. I'm feeling very hungry. I haven't had any breakfast because uh, I came at nine o'clock to the office, so I had to rush. Can I go? So we're all very hungry. No, can I be? Can I go first? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, Yes, yes, go ahead, please. I, I simply just wanted to round off a particular point that you raised several times and so did uh, Professor Harda and, and in a sense, um, Professor Kulkarni or Dr. Kuls is also working on what you call oral traditions, folk traditions, and how these stand outside of, as it were, the high textual histories that tend to be written. My submission is that even this is a kind of forced binary that we have been fed that the classical and the popular, the elite and the, uh, the oral or the popular, that these were two, two words that never spoke to each other. I would much rather see them as both plotted on a continuum, which would, con which would slide from one end to the other. And we have one kind of genre feeding into another. So again, to talk of, uh, about the Raj Tarangani or other kinds of kavyas or kathas, uh, even in Sanskrit, the so-called language of the elite, which is again a characterization that I contest. But even in those kathas or mahakavyas, you actually have the inclusion of tales that are clearly in that are clearly local, that are clearly folk. So Kalan speaks about Janashutihi, Loka Kathanam, and he is invoking these or as sources at par with his textual sources or with the inscriptions that even Kalan is referring to. History. So I think that this is another point that we need to flag when reconsidering Indian historiography, that these binaries, these compartments that we have imposed on the sources between the classical and the popular, it's time to re-interrogate. That's all. Thank you. Absolutely. I think Colonel Todd, again, the Britishers have done it to some extent. I think he brought uh, Rajasthan alive. And his sources, what were his sources? Colonel Todd's sources, anyhow. Point well taken. It's just that, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, you know, under the guise of rigor, there's, uh, you know, I don't know how historical methods is now being taught, but for many, many years, it was very exclusionary, though the teachers were brilliant. I mean, I'm even talking about JNU. Teachers were great. They were very inspiring, but it was very exclusionary. I don't think that these kinds of issues that you've talked about um, could have been uh, you know, given the sort of weightage you are giving. And, uh, you know, I'm just saying, so this needs to go across the board. In fact, just yesterday, one of our former fellows sent in a message to yes. me in the chat box saying that we don't consider Raja Tarangini as history. And, of course, he's being, you know, he's armed also with a kind of uh, a valorization uh, of the Enlightenment project from Dr. Ambedkar himself. So, you know, things are very complicated. So we must uh, unpack these gradually. Now, uh, uh, the, okay, so let me just call on Churamani ji. Madam, please go ahead. Uh, Anuradha ji, one second. I, I've called on... Uh, Con called on, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Chudramani first, then I'll call on you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Makaranji. And uh, of course, this was a very vibrant session. It was very, very useful. And it's more than a conference. It is like a workshop, the participation and all that. And definitely it's a churn of, uh, you know, all of us are churning and uh, benefits. I want to make two uh, part of it. One is um, responding to Dr. Jain's, uh, you know, on caste and uh, these aspects. Um, as a person uh, from the sociology background also, um, while I was discussing with my uh, uncle, Professor M.S.A. Rao, 
of uh, Delhi University Sociology. He is no more long there. And uh, we were discussing about the caste system. He has written uh, so much about the caste system and he was a very close contact with Gure and all that. So while stratifying, you know, stratification of society is definitely, uh, you know, one society or any society cannot escape from this stratification. So in that sense, uh, India is stratified because of the caste system. So this caste system, instead of looking at from the activist perspective, that what we are seeing all these years, why can't we see the benefits of the caste system? And when my uncle, we were discussing, we also felt that this was a defensive mechanism. Caste system was a defensive mechanism to stop India to become Islamic or the other. So this is the defensive mechanism. It was such a complex thing. It was not possible. If it was one kind of, uh, you know, Varna or Jati, we could have been easily taken to other uh, you know, uh, kind of faiths. So what I mean to say that let us stop talking, you know, in an activist mode about the caste system. Look at the benefits and how it led the Indian society for more than 5,000 years, it has not created any problem here. Only the problem we are seeing now since 75 years or so. So even this should become part of our history right? This is one. The second one, what I mean to say is, you know, I was attending a lecture of Professor Kapil Kapoor. Most of you in Delhi, you know the thought process of uh, Professor Kapil Kapoor and I had the opportunity to work with him in the language, uh, you know, uh, committee, which was constituted and we all worked together for almost one year constantly. So he was telling that Indian civilization is dictated with or dominated with the knowledge system. So in India, the civilization, if you take it, Every first book of every field is contributed from India. You start in a Chakinga. Chakinga. You, will, you will know, starting from Natya Shastra, you can check. First book. So, such a you know, knowledge society. Today, you know, saying, somebody is saying that, you know, they don't know history, they don't know. See, what is this? And another thing uh, is that knowledge is power and India enjoyed always knowledge as power and Kavya, as somebody was mentioning that, whether Kavya taken as history, definitely, definitely. We have to, it is one of the primary sources for writing Indian history. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank so, you Dr. Chudamani, thank you. All this, and continue to work in that direction. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. That. Thank you for your interventions. I just wanted to add a little uh, a note about the uh, the caste and its uh, rigidification or stratification. Professor Wink also said it seems a medieval institution. And I'm curious to know, as somebody told me, whether some of the groups uh, who resisted uh, the invaders were deliberately degraded within quotes and given uh, these lowly uh, caste status when they refused to convert, you see. Uh, Jazia was there. There are many such. So there are these, and there are some records. I've been reading about them. The Jatis themselves have a record in their own uh, Puranas where they say that we were the rulers and uh, then we were made the cleaners, you know, things like that. So. That's one point that has come up. As to being the oldest and all, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, people keep saying all this, but I know that uh, the pyramid at, at Giza, 137 meters up almost 140 meters, built about 5,000 years ago. Nothing like that anywhere in the world I know of, certainly not in India. So I don't think we need to take that position. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, every, to, to each her own, there's no, there's no issue. Again, this is a different kind of polemics. This is an account of polemics, you know. But uh, let me see if Professor Wink wants to say something before I call Anuradha ji. 
Professor Wink, would you like to say something, Professor uh, uh, Andrew uh, Andre Wink? Unmute yourself, sir. Please unmute, unmute yourself. I hear you. Um, yes, that's good. Yeah, I didn't. Um... I wasn't able to attend the first part of the presentation, so I'm not sure if I should comment on this. Um, I, I'm not sure if I understood the polemics entirely, so the, no, I would rather not comment on it. Uh, ji. You have to unmute. Sorry, I was saying it's wonderful to uh, see Chudavani ma'am again after many years and also to uh, listen to so many eye opening insights of these esteemed uh, historians. Uh, one uh, question that was a follow up uh, to uh, Professor Wing's uh, presentation, but just a quick one was this about the fact that this uh, need to emulate the empire story is it because uh, of establishing a certain degree of development? Like, was it to show that they were so advanced in technology and that's why they're trying to emulate that? I was just like curious to understand the rationale behind that uh, attempt to, you know, um, seek uh, empireship in a particular model while we might have had our own. So that was one for you. And uh, the other one, a general comment for a general observation. And it's a very genuine uh, question that when we talk of the Yoga Shastras, then we accept that people can have, you know, uh, that people's Realizations can belong to different levels of reality. In when we're reading the Ramayana <clears throat> or different texts, when they talk of these multi-planed interactions of the human beings with other forces, etc., how does history uh, view such, or how does history represent such interactions? Because it's like trying to portray a three-dimensional uh, reality onto a two-dimensional one. So. Uh, without calling it a myth, because myth make, makes it unreal. Whereas these are real experiences. Uh, in the yogic domain, they would be considered as real. But does history, how does history portray them is something I was very curious to know, because we've loads of it in our uh, culture. Our civilizational stories are replete with them. Uh, Professor Wink? Um, yeah, well, when I was, um interest in the caste system. Uh, I spent some time in the Indian villages and you know, that's where many people um, in the 70s and 60s did village studies and it was a kind of a wave of studies of caste. But later when I tried to find out about the history, um, well of course there were always people, in, especially in the United States, who were um, saying that it was a British creation to some large extent. I don't agree with that. I, I certainly changed a lot under colonial rule. But um, I do find an uh, enormous number of references to caste in 18th century accounts and earlier. But I couldn't trace it back further than the 4th century AD. I mean, I could find, of course, texts that mentioned it, but historical evidence of the Indian caste system does not exist before. I believe it's the fifth century BC. <clears throat> and then you hear about untouchability and all kinds of things that have to do with uh, commensality. And uh, in the, later in the Middle Ages, the evidence becomes quite abundant. And it, it is really not so different from what it is, is today. So my view has become that um, um, it's medieval development, although um, there are texts that um, are not historical, mention it earlier. And my second conclusion has also been that it, the Indian caste system is certainly uh, unique, but there are many elements that we find in medieval Europe as well. Um, so uh, all these taboos and uh, rules of purity and pollution, um, the, uh, these are not so unique. Um, there are specific forms that it takes in, uh, in the culture, uh, they are. And then the, fi the final thing I also um, wanted to know is, do we find caste um, in uh, 
places like Cambodia, Indonesia? Um, and the answer is um, yes, to some extent, but not in a far different form. So I was interested in these different forms in the overseas, so-called overseas territories, like uh, and, and in, in Sri Lanka, where caste has become very different, but does exist. And so in Indonesia, you have evidence of a very elaborate caste system, which is also very different from India. So my conclusion on this subject, as far as you can find it, uh, reach a conclusion, because not really all that much written about it, is that it was um, something that has to do with settled society. And this is also my impression from the many accounts of Malabar. And Muslim accounts uh, in the medieval time also seem to suggest that it has something to do with settled society and people in forest um, environments or the desert and so on, they, they just don't have it. So this is more or less the picture that I try to develop. And when people, um, the caste Hindus, go to Central Asia, they, um, they tend to maintain uh, their caste rules and uh, or very often become sojourners rather than permanent settled settlers. So this is another indication that we have to do, do here, to do here with a settled society. Caste Hindus abroad tend to be a temporary. That is a... Um, striking. These diasporas of merchants, they were uh, very often temporary and rarely married into the host society. So yeah, there are all these different issues of caste and uh, I also say that in the 18th century, especially French accounts of the Enlightenment were great admirers of Indian caste, that it was a very uh, useful an excellent um, organization which produced sometimes supernatural skills in particular profession, professions. And the great, um, the high, very high development of Indian agriculture is sometimes attributed to caste by, by French Enlightenment accounts. So it's not at all negative. You find uh, lots of praise for it before the British. Um, and I, that was rather interesting. The, the French Enlightenment accounts. Uh, for example, as collected by Delory in uh, Les Indes Florissant, was always very positive about the Indian caste system. And too bad that the French didn't have it and so on. <laughs> so it's always interesting to study caste. Uh, there's so much controversy about it. Um, but these are some of the things that, uh, that struck me. The, the theory that um, lower caste converted to Islam to escape is uh, not historically valid. It happened in modern times sometimes, but in Pakistan, the theory is very popular that uh, the lower caste um, couldn't take it any longer and they wanted to become Muslims. And that's why Pakistan is such a great country. Abolish the caste system. This is complete nonsense, of course, but it is a popular theory in Pakistan. So oh, yes, uh, caste has been. Uh... No, what, what what about that question that I asked you, which is that is it true that those communities who resisted the invaders uh, and did not convert were degraded in the social hierarchy and made to do menial and uh, you know so-called unclean tasks because uh... the, the the narratives of some of these communities say, oh, we were kings and then we were dragged down because we resisted conversion, we resisted the invader. We, we did not, they did not convert to what? To Islam. So oh, because no. they refused yeah. to convert to Islam, they got degraded and made, they were made to do well, humiliating if, tasks. If that were, yeah, if that were true, the uh, Ranas of Mewar would be on the bottom of the pile. Whereas they are not, they are considered the oldest noble dynasty in the world. Uh, you no, know, maybe. Th those yeah. who resisted, oh. those who resisted and lost were enslaved, and when they were when they refused to convert, were degraded in the caste system. This is the idea, not the ranas, because the ranas were never completely taken over. No, but, but many they, other did, they did not convert. 
I'm just uh, bringing that up as an example of people who resisted. The, the Mewar uh, Ranas were resisted, uh, even Mogul, and successfully. They never intermarried with the Mughals. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And they, they, were the high, they were the highest, uh, they had a very high rank. Of course. Rash we are not and talking I about that. We are talking about some of the present uh, considered scheduled caste or menial classes who then trace their genealogy to times when they resisted conversion but were enslaved or degraded and made to do menial tasks. This is the, yeah. This yeah. Is the argument. Well, but, you're, talking, you're talking about the, the present times, the modern times. Uh, no, I'm saying that if you look at certain communities, like say the Minas, I'll give you one example in Rajasthan. The Minas consider themselves to be rulers at one level, yeah. at one time. Then they got yeah. supplanted and they got, and now they're considered scheduled caste. Yeah. You know? But I think we'll leave this for another time. Uh, I'll I, now, I think I that I, you're to... right about that, yes, but it's not because I... they not want to convert to Islam. Uh, yeah, I don't the... think so. I, I agree, so. not the Minas, but there were other communities. If you look at today, those are called Jatois, some other communities who are uh, Valmikis and others. They have these stories where uh, they were in the area like UP, which was completely ruled by different, uh, you know, dynasties after the Mughals as well. And uh, in Varna Vyavastha, they were, as it were, pushed down. Yeah. The, re yeah. the reason is partly because they didn't want to convert and they were yeah. given a lower ritual status and made to... See, those who did not collaborate or convert were usually humiliated. The, well, and, yeah. If, yeah. if, you, yeah, read, if you read certain accounts, I read a whole uh, set of edicts that one of the Mughal emperors had passed, or maybe even earlier, where they said, uh, Hindus cannot ride a horse, cannot ride a, cannot carry a sword, cannot wear a, wear a turban, cannot wear footwear. And then they say, this doesn't apply to Rajputs, you know? I mean, I've seen it. I've yeah. seen that document. Uh, so there was and, a system. Uh, it didn't apply to Marathas either. Well, yeah, the, the, the things that were called Marathas, they came up later. I'm talking about Delhi Sultan. Uh -huh. but, but anyhow, we are getting sidetracked. Yeah, yeah. Let us see. Let us see if there are other comments. Otherwise, I will simply ask uh, Professor Chakrabarti to uh, to say a few words, and we will end with that. Once again, thank you all. It's been a scintillating two days, and we've all benefited immensely. Certainly, I have learned a lot, especially since I'm not a historian. It's been a treat for me, and it's also allowed me to revisit some of the ideas that I've been carrying in my head for several years and to go back to certain moments in the 19th century, including Bhude Mukhopadhyay's Swapnala Bharate Ritihas, where the pressure to create history and the inability to do so was so severe that you resorted to a history written in a dream in the form of a novel. So as a reader of texts, I find that fascinating. And that's just the time when at Fort William, uh, you know, the early British administrators were hiring Munshis and Pandits to help them translate texts. And uh, Colebrook was uh, uh, translating Hindu code and so forth. William James was translating Abhijnan Shakuntalam. And, uh, and the generation of Bengalis went to Presidency College founded in 1817 or 1818, etc. And there, the pressure to write history started in a way that was acceptable uh, to our rulers and to the modern world. And uh, I think that some of the uh, questions and contentions over the discipline begin there. Anyhow, thank you all very much. I invite the Sorry. Could you go you, ahead. Go could ahead. You the text? This is the first go ahead, Shonal, Shonalika ji. Go ahead. You just repeat the name of this fascinating text you mentioned, Swapne Labdha. Uh, it's called uh, Swapna Labdha Bharater Itihas or Shopna Labdha Bharater Itihas, and it is by Bhudev Mukhopadhyay. I believe there's an English translation, I'm not sure. 
but it's mentioned in Sudipto Kaviraj's book, uh, The Unhappy Consciousness, the book on Bankim Chandra Chakravart or Chattopadhyay. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. More of this later. Dilipda, please give your concluding uh, uh, blessings this is the, or this comments. This is the first time that I've had the privilege of attending such webinars. And I must confess that I deeply enjoyed being present, so to speak. Now that I've got a moment, may I ask Professor Mathob Hada about something? I'm desperately keen on. Professor Mathob Hada, please. are you there? Yes, yes, he's there. Please ask me. Now, is there much material on the Banjaras in Rajasthani literature? Banjaras. <laughs> No, 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 nothing available, sir. So there should be private, there should be papers of the Rajasthan Royal Houses, administrative documents. There should be mentions of Banjaras because Banjaras are a very prominent community. Banjaraj ka ullekh in Veer Vinod mein bhi hai aur Rajasthan ka ek baut mahatupun document hai, wo hai Atarasso Ikarano ki Mardum Sumari report. Jati Yunki Utpati or Riti Rivaj is a memory. Usmebi Banjaraj. Kya name? Kya name? Mardum Sumari of 1891. Yeah, Hindi translation will be available in Rajasthan Rajasthani Grantha Gar. Or Jo Sarabi Bath Karate. वर्ण गतिशीलता और जाति गतिशीलता की आ, उस किताब की सबसे बड़ी विशेषता यह है उसका जो हुआ यह कि 1891 में मर्दम शुमारी हुई जनगणना हुई तो जोधपुर इजाइज ने इसने कहा कि आ, हम जातियों की उत्पत्ति और रीति रिवाज भी एकत्र करवा लेते यह अच्छा अवसर है लेकिन इसके लिए किसी शास्त्र का सहारा नहीं लिया गया पंजारा Administrative document in the Rajasthan Royal Houses. Nothing there, nothing is there. Joe document ma apko batarang wo memories per unse ye kaag punch patelo se kaag yaki aap apni jati ke barem batai utpa uski utpati kase hui or abhi same na hi hai nahi to mirpas e so daran onge just me ye adikans jo transformation hai. Uh, वर्ण का और जातियों का वो सल्तनत काल में हुआ मुगल पीरियड में बहुत कम हुआ सल्तनत काल में प्रतिरोध की प्रतिरोध सहन ही नहीं होता था तो जिन जातियों ने प्रतिरोध किया उन उनसे उनको नहीं रहने दिया गया बहुत सारी जातियों के जैसे जालोर की एक जाति है राजपूत हैं उन सब ने एकत्र होकर तय किया कि हम हल्की मूठ पकड़ लेंगे मतलब राजपूत क्षत्रिय हल्की मूठ नहीं पकड़ता लेकिन उन्होंने तय सब ने मिलकर बैठ कर तय किया कि हम हल्की मूठ पकड़ लेंगे तो वो सब बंजारा के ऊपर राजस्थान में कुछ किसी ने लिखा है कि नहीं नहीं देखिए एक जो डॉक्यूमेंट है वो सेमी नोमैड्स पर है लेकिन बंजाराज पर अलग से कुछ भी नहीं है ऐसा वहां पर कुछ नहीं है uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Chakrabarti, uh, there is some research done on the Banjaras in Telangana, and uh, there are some Jati Jati Puranas, because a lot of Banjaras migrated uh, to Telangana region. And Hyderabad, Eflu, Eflu, that is English and Foreign Language University. Some there's been a PhD or one or two of these done on that. So I can put you in touch with uh, the, the guide is a man called Venkat Rao, Professor Venkat Rao. If you like, I can send you his email ID. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Ask him. I can send Thank it to you in the chat box right now as we talk. Uh, I don't know fact, how to use I, chat box. I don't know Professor Hariram Mena. He has worked We will get him to email you. We'll ask Ritika ji to email you. And uh, we just want you to now to just bless us and finish this, uh, uh, put it to a close. And uh, 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 and so uh, uh, I request you, sir, to, to bring our discussions to a close. It's almost two o'clock. It's a good time to close it.
الابداع it is a great seminar and i deeply enjoyed listening to you all uh, and that's all thank you very much indeed thank you all thank you and uh, hope we keep in touch thank you so much bye bye thank you too bye, bye.